Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is Wallace Thornhill. Wallace, or Walt, as he is known to his American audience, is the Chief Science Advisor to the Thunderbolts Project and Vice President of the nonprofit US T Bolts Group. He has an extensive scientific background as a systems engineer and has published two books with colleague David Talbot, the first titled Thunderbolts of the Gods and the second, The Electric Universe, on the combined subjects of the recent history of the solar system and the electrical nature of the universe. Hello, everybody. Several years ago, I came across the Thunderbolts Project while studying mythology. I heard of David Talbot's mind-blowing explanation of origin myths and how so many of the ancient rock symbols were being reproduced in laboratories that were injecting high-voltage currents into a plasma medium. I found that intriguing. I tracked down the Thunderbolts project, purchased their books, studied them, and was amazed. That led me to the Electric Universe Collective from there. Through my exposure to the Thunderbolts project and the Electric Universe, I found many excellent videos by their chief science advisor, Walt Thornhill. I found the very many explorations of the universe, its electric dynamics and information on star formation, planet formation, and even life on Earth and the way our bodies work, very, very informative, logical, and inspiring. Walt Thornhill and the many scientists working in the Thunderbolts and Electric Universe projects tackle a number of the big questions that have been ignored, fudge-factored, and often dogmatized by mainstream science cosmologists and many working in the field of quantum physics. I was delighted when Walt Thornhill agreed to do a long enough podcast with me to really dive into some of these concepts. In this podcast, you're going to hear some truly mind-bending concepts being explored. And like all pioneering scientists, Walt is surely to say things that make you question deeply. He will refute such things as the Big Bang, dark matter and dark energy, black holes, and even photons. I'm not sharing this interview with you because I believe all that he's saying, but because the science and the scientists within the Thunderbolts and Electric Universe projects are all very wise, credible people asking bigger questions and doing solid research to answer them. We can't possibly think or learn effectively if we just stick to a dogma, no matter how often it is repeated as truth. We can't possibly think or even learn effectively if we just stick to a dogma, no matter how often it is repeated as truth. But being open-minded and exploring opinions that contradict what is believed in our consensus reality is the only way to gather the information and the data to begin meditating on, processing, and doing the research we need to answer our own questions authentically. I hope you enjoy this deep dive into the thunderbolts of life and the electric universe with Chief Science Advisor Walt Thornhill. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Living 4D with Paul Check. I am very excited to share my guest with you today, Walt Thornhill, who is the Chief Scientific Advisor for the Thunderbolts Project, He's also a big part of the Electric Universe, and I've been studying their material for quite a number of years right now, and it's very, very fascinating, and it's it's not nearly well enough known. It's mind-blowing, it's revolutionary, and it gives us a whole new view of the cosmos, and it not only includes cosmology, but it looks at things like our planetary systems, our sun, stars. And it goes all the way down to human, the human body and the work of Jerry Tennant, who I've also seen on the Electric Universe presenting. And I've seen presentations all the way down to the microorganisms and the bees. So, Walt, welcome. It's exciting to have you here. Thanks for the invitation, Paul. It's my pleasure. Um, to begin with, Can you share an overview of your background, education, and what got you into the Thunderbolts Project and the Electric Universe, and maybe an overview, sort of uh, what the overall uh, gestalt is of the Thunderbolts and Electric Universe projects? Well, I think uh, this is a path that uh, it was my destiny, because uh, at a very young age, I was very interested in uh, the planets and uh, the moon and uh, all of that sort of thing. I had an uncle who was in the uh, commandos in New Guinea during the war. In fact, I was a wartime baby, and uh, he brought home his field telescope, and we'd look at the moon through it. So uh, my interest 
uh, was there even in primary school. Now, when I got to university, uh, sorry, uh, to uh, secondary education, to high school, I was lucky enough to be one of those in the year when they introduced a whole lot of new high schools uh, after the war. And so the high school I went into, uh, we were the top form all the way through uh, the high school years, which was an amazing privilege because we had tremendous access to the teachers. And uh, the science teachers recognised my interest and uh, would give me books to read and uh, they even gave me the run of the chemistry prep lab, which is unheard of. I mean, to do it today, they'd be thrown in jail. <laughs> but uh, this uh, meant that I was very keen to learn uh, ahead of what I'd been taught. And partway through the high school years, my father, who was... Uh, a war pensioner and uh, also an invalid uh, brought home a book from the hospital one time and he said, I think you might be interested in this. And it was Velikovsky's Worlds in Collision. Now that book was the top seller for six months on the, uh, in, the, in New York and uh, the publisher, unusually, was a textbook publisher, Macmillan's. And yet the bad behaviour of the astronomers of the day uh, brought about what you might call a metaphorical book burning, a modern day book burning, because that publisher was forced by the uh, astronomers to give up that book and pass it to Doubleday, a, a popular book publisher. And uh, that's, that was a first. But uh, it gave me the impression that I had to be very careful about accepting the things I was being taught because when I got to university, I thought, well, this will be great. I can talk to people, ask questions and see what the problem is. <laughs> it didn't work like that. Uh, I found out that <laughs> the, I either didn't get the answer to the question I asked or there was hostility that I'd even asked it. And I Same thought, thing well, happens in a church, unfortunately. Well, that's it. And that in later years, I realized that what had happened was that um, the astronomer priests of old were still here and still misbehaving <laughs> uh, at any challenge. So instead of science actually having uh, tried to distance itself from religion, it had actually picked up all the uh, worst aspects of religion and uh, transplanted it to their science, which is um, sort of the worst of uh, both worlds. And uh, anyway, I, I got through university. I actually achieved minor honours in physics, and I also did fourth-year electrical engineering, and I was accepted for postgraduate research. But halfway through that year, I realised that uh, I was wasting my time and I joined IBM because uh, in those days uh, was the pioneering days of computing. And so I got in on the ground floor and with my electronics and physics backgrounds, uh, it was ideal. Anyway, uh, I was, uh, all of this happened in Melbourne. I was born and bred in Melbourne in Australia. And uh, <clears throat> at the uh, end of two years with IBM, I'd uh, had all of the uh, uh, background, <coughs> pardon me, in uh, compilers, operating systems, and all of that kind of thing. And I was sent to fix a problem at the Atomic Energy Commission up near Sydney. And uh, I managed to fix it for them and sent the uh, necessary patches to our compilers to uh, America, went back to Melbourne. And then early in 1997, I was, uh, sorry, uh, it would have been 19, uh, what was it, 67. I was invited into the uh, manager's office in Melbourne and uh, he said, uh, uh, we'd like you to uh, join the team in Canberra, the national capital. And I had an uncle who I'd visited in Canberra and I'd fallen in love with the place. So I said, uh, that sounds great. <laughs> What uh, happened 
very serendipitously is that uh, I was made the systems engineer for the National University, which meant I had the run of the campus, the libraries. I could uh, attend meetings there, uh, which were held by the professionals during the moon landings. So all of this research into Velikovskian style uh, history of the solar system, I was able to carry out personally. Uh, I, I mean, it, it couldn't have happened at a better time or a better place. With that kind of background and doing research on my own uh, over the years, I ended up joining up with David Talbot, who was uh, independently extending Velikovsky's work, looking at what was the real history of the solar system, what were the ancients desperately trying to tell us, why were they afraid of the uh, planetary gods? In fact, why were they even worshipping such a thing? They're just tiny specks of light that most people can't identify in the sky at night now. He answered all of those questions, and what's more, he and a couple of other scholars working on the same problem were able to piece together the recent history of the solar system, which is absolutely dramatic and unlike anything we've ever uh, heard of. And uh, my job, as I saw it, was to explain all of this in terms of physics, real science. And that's taken me a lifetime <clears throat> because it's involved confronting the fact that things that I'd been taught and everyone else believes in is actually incorrect and that uh, somehow I had to be really sure of my grounds before I could go public and, and uh, say the things I've been saying for the last few years. But uh, over time, more and more scholars are, are joining uh, the Thunderbolts group or the Thunderbolts, uh, watch our Thunderbolts uh, space news and that kind of thing and see what the most common response we get is that it just makes sense. It does. I watch it all the time and I go, what the hell's taking people so long? <laughs> These guys are, you know, you know, you can smell the truth. You can feel it. Yes. And that's what was very attractive to me about the Thunderbolts project and, and the things I see on the electric universe. It's like the, the dots connect. You don't have to make these giant leaps of faith like the Big Bang that we'll talk about later. That's quite correct. And this is the kind of feedback that I wanted because to me, I've always had a kind of engineer's approach to science. If I can't imagine how this works and uh, how all of the gears mesh and so on, then uh, I'm not satisfied. I don't like being handed a black box and told that if you put such and such an input in, you'll get such and such an output out and don't worry about what goes on in the middle. Uh, and uh, I've always worried about what's going on in the middle. <laughs> it's called the process. Yes, that's right. Anyway, um, the results that I've come up with have, uh, under, I now understand gravity, and uh, there's only very few scientists in the world who have even come close to that, and uh, some of them I actually got to know before they died, and this has been one of the things that uh, has driven me to take up a leadership role is that the key figures have been one by one over the decades, uh, you know, dropping off. Uh, and uh, that was the kind of thing also which uh, got me to team up with David Talbot. And two years later, I went back and camped on his office floor in Portland, Oregon. And uh, we worked on a our first conference together, uh, which was in January uh, 1997. And it was the first time I presented the electric universe. And at that meeting, I spent a lot of time detailing the electrical scarring of Mars, which is just obvious once it's explained to you. And uh, the uh, also I was looking at the kind of science that we had to explain. And over the years and the decades since, it's been trying to... Uh, you know, dot all the I's and cross all the T's and make sure that it can be presented in such a fashion that if you had to be cross-examined on it, you could survive cross-examination by any expert today. 
And I think we're at that stage now, which is why I'm uh, currently working on a book which will chart the history of ideas and the gen- the uh, gradual departure from reality that we now have with modern science and particularly with astronomy because of, with astronomy we're dealing with things which are too far away for us to actually sample uh, or observe closely and so everything is decided upon interpretation of signals, you know, radio signals, light uh, from telescopes, x-rays. Spectral, spectral analysis. That's right. And, uh, I mean, the technology has uh, progressed remarkably, but technology advances without necessarily understanding the, un- the underlying science. It's simply a case of whatever works in the laboratory you look at it and you say, can we apply this and make some money out of it? And so this is what technology is. You, you uh, discover something, uh, you then invent a use for it, and then you sell it. But uh, a lot of the technology we have nowadays is actually causing us difficulties, uh, both particularly in health, uh, because we manufacture so much. We manufacture our food, we manufacture our medicines, and this manufacturing is not the way the biological system works. It's much more, uh, it's uh, a complete system. And when you tinker with one part of it, you have effects in other parts which are not necessarily uh, predictable or understandable given our present science. You know, um, if I could interject for a second. I tell my students that the body is like a spider's web. You can't pull on one part of it without affecting the whole thing. So when you're reading science that so-called says you can manipulate this hormone, like take a bunch of testosterone because you're 40 something years old, you can't do that without having effects throughout the entire system. Have you, are you familiar with Irvin Laszlo by chance? I've heard the name. Yeah. He's a famous systems theorist. He's a, I think twice Nobel laureate. Um, he's written about 25 excellent books. Uh, I think if you get a chance to look into him, he's got a lot of great stuff, for example, on things like the structure of space and, and all sorts of stuff. He's a, he's a genius. He, he was a concert pianist who had a lot of enlightenment experiences, and, and one thing led to another. I think he's got something like 10 honorary PhDs now from around the world. He's, he's pretty old. He's probably close to 90 now, but he's still quite lucid. And uh, I interviewed him and I said to him, you know, one of the things that concerns me is almost everything that's destroying life on this planet and human beings, including all the drugs that have been manufactured and had to be taken off the market because they were killing people, were scientifically validated. And my concern is that scientists have become the modern prostitutes to major corporations. And he said, Paul, there's a distinction that needs to be made there. Those are not scientists. Scientists would never do that. Those are technicians. Technicians work for these corporations and they're presented as scientists, but the public doesn't know the difference. And I think that's, I'm pointing to your comments there. I think part of the problem is, is we are actually being led down the trail of so-called science and, and, and the priesthood without realizing it's really technicians selling stuff to make a profit, but it's not really valid science because it's their own science and it's not checked by other scientists with differing opinions. It's not challenged is what I'm saying. They don't allow challenges. The system is rigged. Our universities no longer train scientists. They train technologists and they don't, give you alternatives to think about because a scientist uh, has to always consider all of the previous work that's gone into some idea to test to see whether that still remains valid if you want to make some change to it. They don't do that anymore. They used to say it's back to the drawing board, but they never rubbed out what was on that drawing board and started again. They always just added bits around the edge. So that uh, the science today is almost, um, it's incoherent, you know. One thing doesn't tie in with another. It's uh, a little bit here and a little bit there. And this is the, what they call the cult of the specialist. We, we train specialists. And when a specialist says, my work is evidence-based, the problem is that specialist is 
totally unaware of all the other possibilities that may lie outside anything he's been taught. And so to talk about evidence-based science today is rubbish, <laughs> simply because the evidence is can be right in front of their eyes and they can't see it because they've been trained not to see it. And that's important. They're trained not to see alternatives. And if somebody comes along like me, offering an alternative which is way outside anything they've considered before, then, uh, of course, the instant knee-jerk reaction is to ignore it, forget it, or be hostile. Hi, everybody. Thanks for listening to the podcast. The fact that you're here is evidence that you're searching. You're looking into the possibility of bettering yourself, improving the lives of those around you, and maybe even the world. Maybe you're looking for some like-minded people to share the journey with you. That's great, and I hope you're finding all of that here and even more. But feeling a sense of belonging can only get you so far. Getting involved and making a real contribution is what sparks true responsibility and meaning in our lives. That's why I founded the Czech Academy and created an educational system that can help anyone become an elite, well-paid holistic health professional, regardless of prior experience. I created the Academy for people just like you. It's for busy people, people with commitments, people who want to make a change in their lives and a real difference in their clients' lives and the world, and you can build the skills you need and still honor your job and commitments because the Academy is all about quality over quantity. You can complete all of our educational materials within as little as five hours a week and begin to practice your new skills immediately. I've designed the lessons to be that digestible for any student. Plus, you'll have the support of exclusive online workshops, group mentor calls, and of course, your fellow students. It's everything you'll need to become a world-class holistic health practitioner and a real difference maker in the lives of those around you. Go to chekinstitute.com forward slash academy. That's checkinstitute.com forward slash academy to apply and get a free consultation with our career advisors and learn more. Applications are open until November 15th, but I may have to close it down earlier because we've had a lot of applications and there are limited seats in the academy. We try to keep the class numbers down so that there's a lot more instructor contact and better depth and penetration of learning. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing you in the Academy, where we achieve personal well-being and share our love and wisdom with the world. I remember, you know, I've read uh, three different biographies of Einstein, and it, it's very clear that when he came up with the general theory of relativity that the scientific community uh, called him a quack and criticized him very heavily and <laughs> and on my wall I, I've had for years, because I've pioneered a lot of different things. Uh, that are commonplace in health and exercise now, which I won't bore you with the details, but I got a poster on my wall with a big picture of Einstein and it says, great spirits have always encountered violent opposition from mediocre minds. And that's just as true as it gets right there. Yeah. Unfortunately, I have to say that one of the people I've um, removed from his pedestal is Einstein. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, we all... That's called progress. That's called evolution. So I'm, That's right. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I still love him for his spirit and his philosophy of life. And he certainly, you know, took us up a notch. So I think that he deserves his due. And um, oh, I, I have nothing against Einstein, the man. Um, in fact, he himself was very, there is a letter that was published after he died to a friend of his, it was a personal letter, saying he doubted whether anything of, that he had produced would uh, stand the test of time. And uh, that is an honest assessment. And being honest, uh, he was right. It won't stand the test of time. There's very good reason for him to say that. Uh, and he, he was probably aware of it and it niggled with him. So the phenomenon of Einstein is really one about how science turned to, into show business after the, uh, well, after the First World War. Because there's a couple of stories that I recall. One was um, the Royal Society, who were some of the most, uh, the strongest critics initially, 
Uh, once the test had been done to detect uh, gravitational lensing, and it was very poorly done, by the way, it's certainly not evidence-based, um, uh, it was like people were looking for some new way of, looking, of seeing the world. They'd been through the First World War, which was just a terrible butcher shop, and uh, after the war, people you know, danced in the streets and rejoiced. But the question is, why were they rejoicing? You know, none of what had happened could made any sense whatsoever. And the carnage was terrible. Now, Velikovsky himself, being a trained psychoanalyst, apart from being a, a very uh, uh, a polymath, you know, a very clever scholar, classical scholar, uh, understood that and had words to say about it, which I won't go into here because that's a whole extra subject. Um, but mankind goes through this paroxysm on a regular basis. It's like a, right it's now? A cycle. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> right now. We're, we're, when I was, after the Second World War, when I was growing up, we knew all the neighbours in the street, everyone pulled together. If their um, electricity failed, they'd come and use our wood-fired stove to cook their meal. Uh, we knew people down the road and the other, you know. It, nowadays, people are, are lucky if they know just their immediate neighbours. <laughs> so there's this sense of, yeah. you know, you're not even, we're you're all not even allowed to know your neighbours right now. It's such a farce. I've never <laughs> seen such a scam in my friggin' life. Uh, it's dreadful. But it is a kind of... Uh, mindset that the the human race really, according to uh, Velikovsky, in modern terms, is suffering post-traumatic stress disorder from having lived through a doomsday event way back. It was actually prehistory, but it was remembered down through all the classical period, the, you know, the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Sumerians, all of these people have the stories which Velikovsky and Dave Talbot and others have put together and been able to analyse like a detective story, you know, you use a forensic analysis and you look at the key aspects of what the ancients were desperately trying to tell us and saying, okay, this culture says they identify Venus always a female with long flowing hair or as the Medusa, the Gorgon, the horrible creature which can turn man into stone. Uh, and then you look at some other group around the world and they say the same thing. Venus was always a female goddess and she was either beautiful, magnificent, or absolutely terrible and, and uh, dis the destroyer. And you go to the South Sea Islands, you see the same thing. And in fact, the Australian Aborigines, which is one of the longest uh, living human cultures today, I think, uh, their stories are some of the most accurate ones I've read. And they tell of a time when there were two suns in the sky and you say, what? How can that be? Well... <laughs> guess what it's not an unusual story and uh this is all the kinds of stuff i had to grapple with uh because uh one guy in particular Eduardo cardona the canadian of maltese background uh, was a prodigious uh researcher and has published thousands of uh pages uh of uh his analysis and uh he and i corresponded quite a bit because he would ask me to try and explain scientifically what he was discovering. And I'll give great credit to all of these people because what they did was to say, what did these stories mean? They, there was obviously a period in history or prehistory when things were happening which we don't see today because everyone afterwards misinterpreted them. But the one key thing which brought my work in plasma science and physics and whatnot together with Dave Talbot's was the thunderbolt. What was this thunderbolt of the gods? It certainly wasn't lightning, it, not earthly lightning, because they actually sculpted it, they drew it, and it's nothing like it. Uh, people who've seen the Tibetan Dorje, uh, who've seen uh, the symbols on uh, buildings uh, the crosses, the uh, even the star inside a crescent, which is an impossible astronomical uh, picture. All of these things are explained by Dave Talbot's work and Dwayne Cardona, who extended uh, Velikovsky's suggestions about there being a former uh, son of night, a, a second uh, stellar body 
associated with us. All of these things come together into the most amazing story, which I'd love to see on an IMAX screen one day. And when people see these images as they really were, and then they can see them related to everyday things like the design of buildings, their obsession with skyscrapers ever higher towards the gods, all this kind of stuff suddenly makes sense. But also our fearfulness makes sense. But once you understand the cause of the existential fear, which is something that we're suffering right now with all of this, the scare tactics and whatnot of the media, you, you actually can heal from it. And that's what Velikovsky said. We have to understand the past to get rid of the bonds of the past. Now, that was made into a documentary, by the way, by the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation back in 1972. And it's well worth a look because it's a kind of a personal story of Velikovsky. Where What's he, the title? He discussed uh, The Bonds of the Past, CBC, 1972. You will find it actually on YouTube. Is that CBC or CDC? Uh, Canadian Broadcasting oh, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, Corporation 1972. Yeah. yeah, I'll look yeah. for it. I'd love to see that. When, when you have a, a break in your train of thought, I have a question that I want to ask you as well. Okay. Uh, well, I think this was started out talking about how I got to where I am, and it's already giving you some of the uh, things that have resulted from that uh, journey. But it's been a long journey, and uh, it's the most difficult thing throughout that journey has been to actually give up ideas that I felt were bedrock, you know, things I'd been taught. All my teachers taught me, all the lecturers taught me and uh, which I took on faith originally, giving that up as the hardest thing. So I can see why the sort of things that I, I'm suggesting now can be so confronting to people who have a vested interest in the roadmap that they've been brought up to believe in. Well, you know, um, I interviewed James Kars, who wrote a phenomenal book called Finite and Infinite Games, and he also wrote one called The Religious Case Against Belief. And in The Religious Case Against Belief, and, and he is a professor of theology and philosophy. He's retired now, but he's a really, really sharp guy. You might find in my podcast with James Kars quite fascinating. Um, but he, he goes to great length in his book, The Religious Case Against Belief, to explain what a belief system is and how dangerous it is and and the fact that they're closed. And so I think everything you're describing is really the clash of belief systems. And, you know, one of the quotes I love from David Bohm is real thinking is hard work. That's why most people just <laughs> rearrange their prejudices and call it thinking. And I think that most people are too lazy to actually think for themselves. They're just, we've been pacified by hierarchy, priesthood, and figures of authority to just shut up, listen, and be like little copy and paste machines. And anytime you ask critical questions that challenge the belief, you get treated like a slave who is not being paid to think, but being paid to dig and do other things. And so we've got a, an education system, unfortunately, that teaches people what to think, not how to think. And that's exactly why I left school in ninth grade, because teachers wouldn't answer my questions. I got the same problems in a Christian church and it used to just piss me right off. And I'm like, how the hell can you not answer these questions when I'm asking a legitimate question that should concern everybody who's got common sense? But so I'm, I'm with you all the way. I, I want to sneak this question in because you mentioned the aboriginals and I'd written this note down from the beginning of our conversation, but just didn't want to interrupt you with it. In my library, I have a lot of books. And in one of them, I think it might be Voices of the First Day, which is a very beautiful expose of the Aboriginal culture by Robert Lawler, who is an, uh, Robert Lawler is an amazing philosopher and writer. And in some of these, in the book I'm referring to, they show pictures of Aboriginal star maps that scientists investigated and found not only to be exquisitely accurate, but it was very confusing because they said there's no way the aboriginals could have seen these stars with their naked eyes. They concluded that you would have had to have 
50 times the strength of vision that a human being has to even begin to see these stars. I'm curious, how do you think it is that these Aboriginal people could map the stars so accurately without telescopes? I'd have to look at the actual work they're referring to, but one of the things that happens all of the time is that the Aboriginal stories are analysed in terms of what we think we know about the history of the solar system, and uh, that history is completely wrong. And that is that the skies that the Aboriginals witnessed in the past were not the ones that we see now, and therefore the interpretation of star maps of the Aboriginals are often incorrect. I know I've actually uh, had an argument with one of these people who considers himself an expert on the subject uh, here in Australia, and uh, I wrote to him and said, uh, or pointed out some of the problems that he faced, and he was uh, quite rude in his response. In other words, I am the expert around here. Who do you think you are? Yeah, well, normal. Well, <laughs> the problem is being, being an expert doesn't mean that you know what you're talking about. It just means that you know what you know what you know. And anything outside that is uh, is complete mystery to you. And so you have to take the word of experts with great caution. Yeah, I was just curious because you'd be the right guy to ask a question like that. So <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that. And I've watched a lot of the presentations by David Talbot and you and many of the other people on the Thunderbolts project in the electric universe. So I'm, I'm fairly hip to where you guys are going and I've seen the movie and the, you know, the, the stuff about the planets and the stars and their relationships and how different they are. And, and that's why I wanted to have you on here because I really think, you know, more people need to start thinking critically and hearing from people that are more open-minded and and are bringing us more factual information that actually makes sense. Yeah. I think one thing that's worth noting is that the older I get, the more I realize that uh, the scientists of the 19th century were closer to the truth than we are today. And the 19th century was one of the most productive uh, in history because that was when we were discovering electricity and magnetism. And yet, at the, with the advent of Einstein and Niels Bohr, we suddenly stopped doing physics and started doing mathematics. And mathematics has no, no relationship to physics except as a descriptive tool. And if you don't understand what all of the symbols mean physically, and what all of the uh, mathematical operators between those symbols do to those physical systems, you do not, you're not doing physics. And this is the state today, and it's what happened. I mean, Einstein was misled by some of the people that he worked with into doing differential geometry, which has nothing to do with the real world of three dimensions. And so um, <laughs> what we have today is a a kind of weird kaleidoscope of uh, mathematical uh, inventions so that, as one wag said, uh, we've got dark matter and dark energy and black holes with so much darkness we'll soon know nothing. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Um, uh, that's very, very accurate. <laughs> you know, you bring it up an important point that I want to elaborate on a little bit. Uh, I've read several authors that are you know, very intelligent and open-minded in in the fields of quantum physics or cosmology. But one of the things that comes up fairly often, if you read the right people, is that mathematics is only one way of perceiving the universe or perceiving life. But it there's other ways, such as poetry, such as music, uh, etc. And so it's almost as though we've put all our eggs in one basket and, and then deified it as the only way to perceive things. And the problem is that the average person out there does not have any even close to the mathematical knowledge to know whether or not what they're reading is correct. Therefore, they just believe it because it came from some scientist. So it's almost like we've all been hypnotized by a very few people, which is exactly what COVID is doing to us. Yeah. Hello, everybody. 
In my career as a holistic health practitioner, I've seen a long string of cases of people that showed signs of protein deficiency on lab testing, even though they were eating plenty of protein from animal sources. The problem was that they were eating commercially raised animals, which are loaded with dangerous toxic farming chemicals, antibiotics, and other drug residues, and the garbage stuffs that they feed commercially raised animals. I've also rehabilitated a long string of vegans and vegetarians who were suffering serious hormonal and physiological imbalances because they were living off commercially raised plant foods, which are also toxic. Additionally, not everyone has the genetic profile, enzymes, or capacity to extract protein from plants, which is trapped in a fiber matrix of the plant. Without exception, and through lab testing, I identified that 100% of these people had leaky gut syndrome, ranging from mild to severe which means that they were developing immune antibodies against everything they were eating, leaving them between a rock and a hard place when it came to finding foods they could eat without further inflaming their guts. One of my professional aids to healing has always been to find super clean, highly nutritious sources of protein that is easily digested, absorbed, and combined with other vital nutrients that people need to heal and regenerate their bodies effectively and efficiently. One of my go-to products for organic, clean, nutritious, high-density protein is Organifi's Complete Protein All-in-One Mix. This amazing protein powder is 100% certified organic, plant-based, with no soy or whey, making it great for people with sensitivities to common food offenders, and it comes complete with organic source multivitamins and digestive enzymes to enhance digestion, absorption, metabolism, and assimilation. Not only will Organifi's Complete Protein help meet your protein needs, it's gut-friendly, super clean, free of additives, preservatives, and colorings that irritate the gut, tastes great, and is great for the whole family, and can greatly enhance recovery from training and developing more lean muscle mass. To get your Organifi Complete Protein in vanilla or chocolate flavor, go to Organifi.com, that's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com, And on checkout, use the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K20 to get your special 20% Living 4D discount, which applies to all Organifi products. So shop around while you're there and enjoy the great organic food for you and your whole family. The astronomer priests have done to us what they did in the past, and that is they uh, used to have uh, the mass in Latin and Of course, the congregation generally didn't understand a word of Latin. Uh, Nowadays, they use mathematics, and uh, only a few people even bother to follow the kind of mathematics that they're talking about. And even uh, then, we have one of the group, uh, Steve Crothers, another Australian, who has pointed out that the mathematics doesn't make any sense uh, for much the same reasons as I'm talking about, that uh, the the symbols are just not... uh, anywhere defined physically it's pretty in this regard i think it's just worth saying here that e equals mc squared is one equation in used in physics which everyone knows about everyone's heard but in fact no one understands even the scientists themselves because there is no definition of mass physically and there is no definition of energy if you look at any textbook all they talk about is conservation of energy Uh, But, sir, what is energy? Well, there is no definition because Einstein removed any possibility of defining it uh, because he made the measurements of uh, used in physics of length and time um, rubbery. You know, they depend on the observer. Well, you know, well, (laughs) as soon as you've done that, you have stopped doing science. And this is one of the reasons I said we stopped doing science with Einstein. And Niels Bohr uh, designed an atom, uh, which is a statistical theory. In other words, there is no physics behind it. It's just statistics because this is what they observed. It has to be explained somehow. Well, we can't quite say what's going on, so uh, we'll measure it and use statistics. Well, you know what they say, lies, damn lies and statistics. The And yet I've discovered in recent years, along with uh, a a Brazilian scientist whom I hold in high regard, Andre Assis, that uh, the great physical scientists of the 19th century actually predicted 
the orbital structure of an atom 40 years before it was discovered. Now, the, these people, these scientists in the 19th century were within a hair's breadth of my where I've got to with the electric universe. So we've wasted 150 years. And that means that uh, all sorts of things like um, clean energy and so on have been delayed by that amount of time. Yeah, that's one of the things I put in the questions to talk to you about, because I think that's critical. And Nassim Harriman, in his series on Gaia, also makes it very clear that no E equals MC squared is really something that doesn't have any value because exactly the reasons that you just shared. And so it's sort of like, you know, people that don't have enough depth to ask bigger questions or don't just don't even know how to ask the questions. That's right. sort we're, of not, just, we're not taught how to ask questions. Yeah. And that's why I tell my students uh, in my institute, for which there's about 15,000 around the world, that what you're going to find is if you look into any topic, you will always find equally qualified experts on either side of an argument that are diametrically opposed. And that's your invitation to investigate yourself and look at both sides of the argument and then do the work that you need to do either by research or talking to other experts or your own inner exploration, depending on what the nature of the question is, and come up to an answer that works for you because you actually can see tangible results if you apply it in your own life. Otherwise, all you're doing is, is just believing shit and you don't know if it's true or not. And that's a great way to end up in a lot of pain and think it's somebody else's fault. <laughs> yes. This is the problem. Um, I've often said to people that uh, it requires coming to these big questions with a beginner's mind. And uh, we're not taught how to do that. If you were taught in school by uh, this teacher giving you uh, one example of an answer to a big problem, like what is gravity, and then you give them another example, and maybe if you have it, even a third example, and ask them to go away and think about which one they consider to be right and give the reasons why. That is the way to teach people how to think. It also uh, gives them the, uh, allows them to come to something with a beginner's mind. And so they understand what that means. But the way we teach technologists these days, they focus ever more narrowly on some certain aspects so that, I mean, I attended, I still do it when I get the chance, uh, meetings of the, in the research schools of the National University here in uh, geophysics and uh, astrophysics. And often the speaker has to get up and explain to his colleagues what the heck he's talking about because his specialty is slightly different from their specialty, but it's in the same discipline. So this sort of breakdown in communication is one of the big problems we have in science. It's the same in, in medicine. It's unbelievable. Oh, I mean, Absolutely. I'm a- I mean, they, they cut out the holistic people simply because they have no physics to uh, underpin the uh, holistic uh, work. Now, the electric universe model shows how you approach the holistic world in a w- rational way and you understand that, in fact, the subtle energy that the holistic people talk about is uh, real and it has uh, a critical function in health. So that what we've got now instead in the so-called health uh, world is an illness uh, system, you know. Yeah, disease maintenance system. It's disease maintenance, yes, because they do not, do not worry about the underlying causes of illness. No profit for them there. No, well, it's, the whole thing has been corrupted. But one of the... This is one of the major things about the electric universe model. It doesn't have all of the answers. That would be impossible, and it would be stupid of anyone to uh, say that they're going to discover a theory of everything because that implies you know everything. Um, But what it does do is it allows you to think about subjects in a completely different way and to ask the real questions instead of the ones that are manufactured simply because your thinking has been wrong up to this point. Yes. What if you could sort of give us an overview of the the vision and the mission of the Thunderbolts project or or the the Gestalt? We've talked about it a bit, but 
if you had, if, if, if I was sitting next to you on, on an airplane and I just met you and I said, well, what is the Thunderbolts project really trying to tell us? What's the message that is coming through it? If you had to break it down into a, uh, an, a, an encapsulated, uh, you know, Chinese <laughs> fortune cookie <laughs> message, just like what's the gestalt of it? It is this, that uh, real science in the past was all about natural philosophy. In fact, when I went to university, uh, embossed in the uh, lintel above the main entrance was the School of Natural Philosophy. Well, that, that's been lost. The natural philosophers were sidelined and kicked out by the mathematicians. I consider myself a natural philosopher. And that means that uh, for any question, you have to range across uh, every every way of thinking like they did in the world of classics. You know, the classical scholars were trained in literature, in art, in uh, the sciences. Music. And it was very, very broad uh, education. And this is what the Electric Universe does, is it shows that, yes, this is the way to do science. And it should not be down to specialists to tell us what to think. But it's open to the public to get involved. It's a cultural activity. And uh, so the Electric Universe is a cultural paradigm shift as well as a scientific one. And the two go together. Because understanding the things that I do now, I realize that we really need to be far more wise in the way we use our technologies. And uh, I have grave misgivings about uh, furthering the uh, discoveries of the, of the electric universe in the face of the cultural uh, milieu that it uh, faces. So, in fact, I believe, along with Velikovsky, that unless we can heal ourselves from the uh, this fear, this existential fear, we will have no future on this planet because that is the thing that uh, really undermines us regularly, repeatedly. Uh, it is the backbone of our religions. Uh, why are we fearful of the gods? Uh, it is uh, the backbone of our militarism. Why do we treat others so badly? appallingly. It is the backbone of our mistreatment of the environment and the earth. We don't see ourselves as earthlings, as an intimate part of this planet. Whereas the electric universe says everything is connected in real time by a single force, the electric force. And all of the other forces are merely manifestations of the electric force through the medium of particles and atoms and the, the structure of matter. Uh, and this realization has taken me decades to to finally uh, be able to see it clearly. Uh, it, and a lot of people along the way, I notice, have caught glimpses of it when they talk about the connectedness of all things, but they haven't had the science behind it to be able to understand it. And the understanding uh, is liberating, both culturally and scientifically. And is this liberation? which I see on the faces of young children who have been taught aspects of the electric universe cosmology. Their faces light up and they can see possibilities. They can understand their place in the universe far more clearly. And that, I think, is one of the big problems with us at present. We have a completely cockeyed view of ourselves and our relationship to the Earth and to our place in this universe and to what I would suggest is a conscious universe. I think personally that Christianity is, is one of the big sources of that split in our psyche. And I mean, I know that there's traumatic events that have happened from my studies of the electric universe and, and other things, but I think that the whole Christian model of Eve eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and then we've got kicked out of heaven and we're fallen beings and we're all sinners and the one thing I love about the electric universe is it really lets you come to the realization that we are part of a very grand whole and that there is no separation and there is no fallen this and, and all that stuff. It's just like it's it's it, it really puts you in the position of being 
in a co-creative position, when you wake up to your own potential and realize that it took the entire universe to make every single human being and living creature on this planet, then you realize, wow, I'm an expression of the whole and therefore I'm part of the whole. And I think if people come to that realization, it helps heal all the the sort of hand-me-down, dogmatic, religious, bogus, scientific beliefs. And, you know, like we look at what's going on in the world today, it's like, if, if you just realize that you have the right to stand up for your own opinion, you should have the right to your own body and whether you get injected or not, what you eat or not. But instead, we've got all this priesthood bullshit and manipulation going on. So I think from my own perspective, having studied the electric universe and many others, such as Walter Russell and a long list of them and mystics throughout the ages, that all the people that really were the great natural philosophers and the great mystics all spoke of the unity. And, and even Rumi himself said, no man could get to God until he becomes a heretic. And, and you know, he was <laughs> implying you, you, don't, you don't become aware of the truth of yourself by reading books and other people's opinions. You have to go out and immerse yourself in the experience of life, and then the truth will unfold itself for you. And a comment that came to me earlier that I wanted to share is that I tell my students, fear makes a terrible seeing eye dog. <laughs> yes, you're right. The I think the um, major aspect of all of this work is that I've come to the the uh, realization that the people who survived what was in effect uh, the end of the world we we felt that the world and everything we we held dear was being destroyed, and we had no power at all in the power of these thunderbolts of the gods and uh, all of the other things that were happening. And uh, so those that were lucky enough to survive, those who hid in caves, you know, the caveman was a modern man trying to survive. Uh, the underground cities they've discovered in Europe and that uh, were people, whole uh, civilizations trying to survive what they thought was the end of the world. And that was coming from heaven, you know, this kingdom of heaven was real to them because they saw things happening up there which looked like it was being built, it was being destroyed, and all of the wreckage was uh, descending on the earth. Um, those people who did survive, I think, had this strange tendency to identify with one of those objects they saw in the sky that they felt was all-powerful, and that became their chief god. And uh, when they got out and found that, no, the world hadn't been destroyed and that they could actually rebuild, there was this tendency to look for someone to blame for what had happened, you know, it brought this all upon them. And so you had the them and us syndrome. And this uh, is what religions seem to me to be largely about, is this division. Because, they're, you know, religions around the world today are the most divisive influence uh, and people do the most dreadful things in the name of religion. More wars have been started in the name of religious differences about God than any other source of conflict, and it's just ridiculous. Yeah, but the Electric Universe offers uh, salvation from that because you understand what it was the ancients were trying to come to terms with and why they would do such a thing. Uh, it was Carl Jung who said when he examined uh, thousands and thousands of psychiatric patients, there were certain themes which kept coming up through uh, these patients and he said unless humanity understands itself we have no future and Velikovsky who came along later and said I now understand what it was that we were afraid of and until we come to grips with that we have no future he was worried at the time about the uh, chance of nuclear war and we came so close to it a couple of times it shows that this human uh, post-traumatic stress disorder could be the end of us all unless we actually try to learn what the ancients were desperately trying to tell us and what we've what a mess we've made of it. I agree, and that's one of the reasons I find the Electric Universe and the Thunderbolts Project so attractive. In fact, a couple of years ago, uh, we did a cruise to Alaska uh, rented a beautiful log cabin place uh, with a 
gorgeous sauna and I had a week and I sat there and watched Electric Universe videos for about a week. <laughs> I had the greatest time. <laughs> I'm like, this is my idea of a good vacation. I get up in the morning, I eat some good food and I watch the Electric Universe for a few hours and I go lift weights and then I come back and watch the Electric Universe and play <laughs> with my kids and then watch the Electric Universe. And I was like soaking this stuff up and just digging it, man. I'm like, I have got to get this. I got to make more people aware of this. Paleo Valley makes some incredible superfood bars that are a lot different than what most people think of as a superfood bar. I've got Autumn Smith, the creator of their superfood bars, right here to tell you about them. Autumn, what is so unique about your awesome superfood bars? Well, our superfood bars are unique because not only do they not contain refined sugar or GMOs or any of the freaky additives that you'll find in most bars or gluten or anything, but they're just whole foods. They're low in sugar. They're made with superfoods like ginger and broccoli and acerola cherry and collagen from grass-fed and finished animals, which we all know is like a fountain of youth. And so the best part about them, though, is probably the flavor. They come in chocolate and apple cinnamon, and we have so many more delicious flavors to come, and they're easy to put in your bag to feed for you with your kids. And I hope you love them all as much as I do. All you have to do to get access is go to paleovalley.com, and you can use the code CHECK15, that's lowercase C-H-E-K, 15, and you can get 15% off. And I hope you love them. That's awesome. And just so you know, that's P-A-L-E-O valley.com. And I know you're going to love Autumn Superfood Bars. You know, one of the things I wanted to ask you uh, moving forward is the ancient alchemists divided the known material universe into elements, which most people deny they say oh that's stupid but they don't realize that the alchemists were actually speaking of frequency ranges the same way we speak of uh, a rainbow or the chakra system for example with the subtle energies which they called earth water fire and air but a lot of electric universe theory is based on plasma dynamics from what i see and there's a lot of plasma dynamics and i'm curious can you share what plasma is how it's created and where it would be from the alchemist perspective of an elemental model i would assume it would be an octave above fire but that's one of the questions i really wanted to ask you for, for my own selfish reasons yeah i think uh, actually the fire they referred to is what we call plasma today because uh, the ancients were subjected to plasma discharges which we have no modern uh uh, experience of uh, and fire does is a plasma if you like because um, plasma is where there's enough energy provided to the atoms and molecules in a solid or a liquid that for instance uh, you have a, a bar of metal you heat it to a certain temperature and it melts it forms a liquid you heat it some more and some of the atoms leave the surface and form a gas and then you heat it some more, and the atoms that in the gas, pardon me, actually dissociate into the positive part of the atom, the nucleus and a number of electrons, and then some of the outer electrons are stripped off. So that you have a positively charged particle and the negative electrons floating around. Is now, that the plasma state? That's the plasma state. Now, what all you need is about one atom in 10,000 to be in the plasma state for that plasma to behave uh, like a conductor, like an electrical uh, object. So that a magnetic field or an electric field, you can hold a magnetic, uh, strong magnet near a flame and it will uh, affect the motion of the flame. I'm going to test that. I've got some very strong magnets I use for various healing and even for creating um, interesting uh, out-of-body experiences. If you put them, one at your pelvic floor and one on your head, it'll uh, do some neat things to you. But I'm going to test that. I think that's fascinating. Okay. In space, of course, the uh, atoms of some distance apart. So it's a very, very thin gas, if you like, extremely thin. And uh, the same thing applies. Uh, one in 10,000 atoms is uh, ionized. That's where the electron is stripped off. And uh, the 
that gas will then uh, act like a plasma. And before the space age, it was considered that space was empty. Uh, there was nothing, you know, there, there might be a few atoms floating around, but uh, it would be a perfect vacuum. And once they got uh, the, up to uh, firing rockets, they discovered the Van Allen radiation belts, and here were all these charged particles whizzing around with high energies. And this was a bit of a shock. Uh, but the funny thing is that back at the turn of the uh, 19th to the 20th century, about the year 900, there was a uh, Norwegian scientist, Christian Berkeland, who at great personal risk uh, set up a, an observatory up in the Arctic Circle to investigate auroras. And he came to the conclusion that charged particles from the sun must uh, strike the earth and must come from the sun to the earth. And uh, of course, at the time this was investigated, or at least when the solar wind was discovered, um, there was um, an Englishman who said, no, no. Uh, in fact, he uh, discredited Birkeland. Birkeland was due for a Nobel Prize, I think, uh, with his work because he set up a little experiment called the Torello, which was uh, what he said was a model Earth inside a vacuum chamber in which he passed electric current. And the thing lit up uh, with auroras, would you believe? He magnetised the sphere inside this big uh, box, which had most of the air taken out, and it had glass sides so he could uh, photograph it. He produced... Um, in effect, uh, sunspots, the rings of Saturn, and auroras, all in his little model Earth. So, um, I think there's videos showing those types of experiments in the Electric Universe system, isn't there? Yeah, because I've watched them. Yeah, he's one of the uh, key individuals in the history of the Electric Universe, which, as I say, extends back uh, in, into way into past history, but it was was forgotten about. It was suppressed, actually. Um, now, today, we look into space with radio telescopes, and radio telescopes can detect magnetic fields by uh, light passing through uh, gas or clouds where the uh, magnetic field lines up uh, uh, particles, so dust particles and so on, so that they polarize the light. What they've discovered is there are magnetic fields everywhere. Space is full of magnetic fields. And yet they just consider them to be frozen into this plasma. They treat it like a superconductor. But plasma is not a superconductor because it radiates radio signals. And radio signals means energy is being lost all the time. And this seems to... Uh, I mean, I've done the uh, uh, postgraduate uh, astrophysics lectures and... Uh, the guy who was teaching us plasma physics, at the end of it, the semester, I went up to him and I said, um, uh, when do we do electric currents in space? And he said, oh, we don't, we don't do that. And I said, I think you might be missing something important here because magnetism doesn't exist without electric currents. And uh, anyway, he just sort of ummed and hard and turned on his heel and walked away. <laughs> God forbid we actually finished the work. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I mean, this is uh, one of these blind spots. You know, you're trained not to see electric currents in space because the, uh, the uh, what would you call it, the dogma is that, yes, there's electricity in space, but it doesn't do anything. Well, here we're talking about a, a force which is uh, one followed by four zeros. That's, you know, 10 to the 40 uh, times stronger than the very, very weak force of gravity. Right. That's, yeah, that's very significant. Oh, absolutely. When you think that our modern cosmology is based on gravitational theory, it doesn't consider electricity. In fact, if you look up the word electric in textbooks and that, uh, you'd be lucky if you find it. That's not good. <laughs> no. Because I have your mind available to me to talk about 
questions that are almost impossible to get answers to. Otherwise, all you do is That's get right. somebody else's dogma, you know. Or they so, use the, the language of modern science, which is meaningless. <laughs> right. That's why I'm trying to take advantage of your presence, because I really love learning other ways of perceiving and relating to things so that I can expand mm. myself. And in so doing, we're expanding a lot of other people as well. Yeah. I think the good thing for me has been that um, a lot of the predictions I've made in the past were outrageous. I was the only one on the planet who made them. And uh, yet they've all been successful. Uh, and this, to me, is a test of whether your physics, your physical theory underpinning it all, is correct or not. And so I'm quite confident that this is the way to go. And, and when I look back in history and I realize that some great minds in the past were so close to where I am now, I realize that uh, this has been a almost uh, an intuitive grasp of something that was already known. So, Walt, if you could... Uh Let's just go into a series of other questions. If the electric universe theory is correct, what changes in the relationship to our currently accepted views of, and you see I have several things, and I gave you the list. Have you got the list in front of you there? Yes, I do. So just for the listeners, I'm asking Walt to explain the electric universe relationship to our currently accepted views of the overall nature of the universe, our understanding of space and time, our general beliefs about gravity, currently accepted views of the standard model of how a sun and stars and galaxies function, the history of our solar system on our planet, um, and the relationship of biological life, including the human body to nature, solar system, cosmos at large. So, you know, knowing that that's a pretty comprehensive list, I'll let you decide how you encapsulate each of those. But personally, I think those are all very, very important questions to address. Mm, they certainly are. The electric universe makes no claim to know the age of the universe simply because we have no idea, we have no way of explaining its origin. Uh, and uh, also, uh, the electric universe has discovered through the observational work of an outstanding astronomer that the universe is not expanding. It appears to be in equilibrium, which uh, re means that. Um, we cannot determine the age by retro calculation. I know you guys have a fair bit on the, uh, I think, isn't there some stuff? Maybe it was a different group I was looking at, but uh, I saw some stuff on why the redshift concept is not reliable. Oh, sure. Yeah, that's, that's the, the work I was talking about by this observational astronomer who was, had his telescope time taken off him when he provided the evidence that uh, the redshift is not a measure of the distance of an object, it has more to do with the age. So the, the more highly redshifted an object is, the younger it is. And uh, so many of the anomalies to do with the redshift uh, hypothesis can be traced to th this idea that it is a, an expanding universe. When you, it's not expanding, these things aren't as bright and as uh, sort of super bright and super big and all of this kind of thing uh, at huge distances. They're actually much closer and fainter than uh, the objects around them. But um, th that's a whole subject. Uh, in effect, what I'm, say I'm saying is that the ages of unknown age and uh, it is, you know, <laughs> it is effectively in equilibrium. Now, the universe, the na yeah, the nature of the universe is that it is an electrical phenomenon, uh, first and foremost. Uh, so that then colours everything that follows. Our understanding of space and time uh, is nothing like what we're being told by the mathematicians, because they talk about extra dimensions, but a dimension in mathematics is a degree of freedom. So the fact that you can twist something as well as uh, move it is a degree of freedom. Uh, it is not 
uh, another universe. There is no such thing as multiverses because the very definition of a universe is all that there is. One uni, one one song. Exactly, yes. Uh, <laughs> so space and time have been lumped together, but neither of them are physical. Uh, space is the co- concept of locations in three dimensions. And so you, it's not a physical thing. You can't lump it together with time and form a fabric. The fabric of space-time is one of these crazy things like the arrow of time. As one physicist asked, uh, can you point me in the direction of time? No, you can't, <laughs> simply because <laughs> <laughs> it has, it's not a dimension. Uh, time is something that we measure by uh, repeated cyclic uh, events like uh, the day-night cycle, the uh, the orbit of the uh, Earth about the Sun and the Moon about the Earth. We measure time by setting up a clocks which are made of atoms and uh, those clocks can be set so that they will count a certain number of ticks when one of these cycles occurs. And so we this is how we measure time. Can I ask you a question uh, before you get to the next topic, if I could? Sure. In my studies, I study a lot of different stuff. And one of the scientists I studied in quantum information processing talked about two kinds of space, which kind of relates to this discussion of time because time is is very relative. Time on Earth is very different than time on Mars or anywhere else due to the cycle, uh, the, the cyclical basis of time measurement. But this particular scientist was saying there's two kinds of space, relational space and non-relational space. And he was referring to information processing and storage. But what he was saying is that Relational space occurs anywhere we have a relationship, such as the distance between the Earth and the Moon, or the Earth and the Sun, or other planets, or the distance from you know your house to the next guy's house. And non-relational space, he was describing as space. It's hard. It's a hard concept to describe, but space where there isn't a point A, point B relationship which more relates to the issue of non-locality. I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on those concepts. Yes. Space is relational. It's all about point A and point B and point C and and the locations of stars and planets and human beings on the surface of the Earth. There's no such thing as non-relational space. Um, And uh, this idea of non-locality is a term that is used by quantum uh, theorists to not say something uh, is uh, connected in real time. You know, if something is connected in real time, then uh, you cannot cannot say that you can't use the term non-locality because non-locality just means that these two particles are connected in real time and there appears to be no uh, delay between something happening here and something happening kilometres away, you know, like two entangled particles. That, that word entanglement, entanglement is another one, a weasel word for not saying they are connected in real time by some force that we don't understand. Well, the electric universe says... That force is the electric force, and it operates in real time. Okay, that, that's the distinction I was looking for, because my first question is, well, how would you explain Bell's theorem then? <laughs> well, I think the whole problem in quantum mechanics comes down to this uh, speed of light, speed limit. Information can, cannot exceed the speed of light. Well, that's nonsense, because these, the Earth knows where the sun is right at this instant. It, or, it, it orbits the sun where the sun is at this instant, not where it appears in the sky, which is eight minutes later. Uh, and uh, this can easily be tested. I mean, it has been tested by certain astronomers, and they say, yep, the Earth is orbiting the sun where it is located at this moment. And it is crucial to having a coherent universe. 
Because if things are disconnected, for instance, if the Earth didn't know where the sun was right now, it would be orbiting a point in space where the sun isn't. And that's just like swinging a stone around your head on the end of a piece of string. Only the piece of string in this case is the electric force. Uh, there's no reason why the body cannot just accelerate, stretch that string and accelerate away. And uh, it has been pointed out by uh, certain astronomers uh, that under such circumstances, the solar system would fly apart in a very short space of time, you know, measured in maybe hundreds of thousands of years, and there would be no solar system. And obviously that's not the case. This isn't what we observe. The Earth's orbit isn't moving away from the sun at any uh, appreciable rate uh, that you would expect if this was the case. Hi, everybody. I'm super excited to announce an amazing offer from Bioptimizers. For those of you that have never tried Masszymes, which are my favorite enzymes, I use them every day. I use them to help me digest food, and I also use them to help clean up my body to increase athletic performance and recovery. But I wanted to share Wade Lightheart with you because he's here with me today, and he can tell you some of the most important things that Masszymes can help you with. Yeah, Masszymes is great for bloating, gas, indigestion, brain fog. If you're waking up with, you know, that kind of foggy feeling, crust in your eyes, bad breath, it's oftentimes because of undigested protein. Right. Masszymes is the strongest proteolytic enzyme blend on the market today. It uses cultured enzymes, which are 10 to 100 times more potent than a regular enzyme. It also includes 14 other enzymes involved as well as astrologous root. And what it does is it will convert, essentially take one gram of protein and create the equivalent of three grams of amino acids, which is what your body actually needs. Normally, our digestive powers wane significantly by the time that we're 30 or 40 years old. And that's right. why a lot of athletes have a hard time recovering. Yes. Masszymes boosts recovery, transforms your digestion, and improves your clarity and focus, as well as a little energy boost. That's amazing. So you have a, a really amazing offer for people. Can you share that offer because I've, uh, this is a rare offer. So wait till you hear this one. Well, if you've never tried mass signs before, we're going to make this super easy. In fact, we're going to give all of your listeners a free bottle of mass signs. Just go to www.masssimes.com slash Paul free. That's M A S S Z Y M E S dot com slash Paul free. And you will get a free bottle. And of course, if you have tried Masszymes, of course, you can go to www.bioptimizers.com slash living4d. Paul10 is the discount code. That's small Paul10. And you'll get 10% off all Bioptimizers products. And it's B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S.com. So thanks, Wade. That's an amazing offer. You guys take advantage of this offer because these are definitely the best enzymes I've ever tried in my life. And I've tried a lot of them. So once you try them and you feel how beneficial they are, I guarantee you you're going to see that mass signs are not a cost. They're an investment in your health and vitality. Wade, thanks for sharing today. Love having you here. Always best to get the wisdom right from the master himself. Thanks so much, Paul. Oh, great spirit. If the electric universe, and you're saying that non-locality is not an issue, it's more of a theoretical construct is the way I'm interpreting what you said. Hopefully I'm correct. Um, the question I have is, from my understanding, and I'm not an expert at electronics, but I did spend a year in electronics school and I was trained to repair weapon systems on Cobra helicopters when I was in the 82nd Airborne Division, so I do have at least a basic understanding the speed of electricity is approximately the speed of light, is it not? Yes. So wouldn't there be a delay with distances like from here to the sun? And if that's... Ah, they're, they're two different things. Meaning? The electric force I'm talking about is like a stretched rope or a taut rope between two objects. And if you tug on the rope and the person the other end of the rope will feel it immediately. In instantly, or yeah. Just, yeah. Whereas a, uh, an electromagnetic wave is like somebody waving the other end of the rope, and I won't feel that until the wave arrives at me. So That's you're the difference. Speaking of really what would be classically called a dialectic or a field of tensions, aren't you? 
No, what we're talking about is a medium called the ether. Okay, so it's the ether that's the medium that creates the rope, and it's the electrical force that's creating the what the pull. No, it's the uh, ether which is the medium which is uh, carrying the wave. It's like you can't have a wave without, without a medium. With yeah, like water or you know a metal rod or something. Uh, if you uh, if you drop a stone into water, the wave travels slowly through the water, whereas the sound of the stone, which is a longitudinal impulse, will travel much faster. So if you had a, uh, a microphone in the water itself, you would hear the sound of the plop long before the wave from the uh, stone reached the same location. Okay, so I'm doing my best to follow you. What An electromagnetic is it? wave has got to travel through a medium, and that medium ha has inertia. It's like water has inertia, it has mass. The ether has inertia, it has a slight amount of mass, and it carries the signal through a dielectric property of the vacuum. The dielectric property of the vacuum shows that space is not empty, it's full of ether. Right. Okay. Uh, interestingly, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this, Irvin Laszlo says that what we think of as empty space is 800 times more dense than steel with a friction coefficient of zero. <laughs> uh, you, you can't compare uh, the ether with steel. Uh, I think he may be using it as an analogy to help us understand that space yeah. is actually very full of stuff, not it, Yeah, it's, it's what they call a plenum, a plenum of... Uh, particles, and a radiation physicist back uh, in Velikovskian days, I came across uh, Dr. Horace Dudley, radiation physicist, and he suggested that neutrinos made up the ether, and years later, I came to the same conclusion. That's the most likely answer, that the universe is full of neutrinos. Because you have a problem in physics uh, that they talk about um, normal matter and antimatter. Now, and the idea that you can bring a particle of normal matter together with a particle of antimatter and the two will annihilate each other. Well, this isn't physics, it's not allowed. The principle of physics is you cannot create nor can you uh, uh, annihilate uh, mat matter. So it means that something's going on which is not covered by so-called modern physics, and that is they haven't defined energy. If, it's going to, if the mass of those particles is going to be converted into energy, you have to know what the heck you're talking about when you say, when you use the term energy. There's no such thing as pure energy because you haven't defined it, which means you, there's no such thing as the Big Bang because you haven't defined your, where's this energy going to come from to create all these particles? <laughs> so the electric universe says that the neutrinos are the substrate of the universe. They carry light. They carry uh, the wave nature of light, electromagnetic signals, and uh, it's full of neutrinos. The neutrinos in the centers of galaxies are subjected to such powerful electric forces that they actually split into a particle and its antiparticle, which means that neutrinos are made up of all of the bits that are required to make, uh, say, an, an electron and a positron, or a proton and an antiproton. I hate that word anti. It's a mirror particle. It's a, yes, it's I'm, a, I'm, I've studied the, the mirror universe. That's part of what's presented in what's called the black hole principle. And they lean pretty heavily on William A. Tiller's uh, science that he presents in his book, such as uh, Science science and Human Transformation. Are you familiar with William A. Tiller? No, actually, uh, any anybody who talks about black hole theory uh, doesn't know what they're talking about because black holes do not exist. Well, they're, they're, it, that, just to make that clear, they're referring to William A. Tiller's work, but Tiller's uh, you know, from Stanford, he's a he's a pretty amazing scientist. I would uh, I would say it's worth looking into some of his stuff because he's not a, a dogmatic guy at all. He's a very deeply spiritual, highly intelligent man. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
I, <clears throat> I haven't seen anything about uh, William Teller. However, getting back to the black holes, um, it is an extrapolation of uh, the weak uh, gravitational force, which is as close to zero as you can get, uh, being 10 to the minus 40 of the uh, electric force. Uh, and they've extrapolated that to try and create something that appears to have an extreme amount of mass in a very tiny volume. And that's, this is dealing with infinities. You know, when you talk about a singularity, that involves infinity. And when you use infinity, you're no longer doing mathematics, let alone physics. So, uh, you know, the whole premise of black holes is, is fails. Um, it is no longer science. Uh, and so <laughs> I, have a, I have another question for you then. Are you familiar with uh, Itzhak Bentov's work at all? Itzhak Bentov invented the pacemaker. He was the first scientist to do actual research on what was happening inside of people when they were meditating. And in his book, Stalking the Wild Pendulum, he says at the exact moment that a pendulum that's swinging changes direction, there's a point in, in its movement where it's at a dead stop. He says it's everywhere and nowhere in the universe at the same time at exactly that moment. So looking at that from a physics perspective, I'm curious as to, because uh, he's describing at that, at that very moment, which is, you know, wickedly fast, he's saying ultimately that the pendulum exists everywhere and nowhere, which, would, which really would come to a place of infinity, because if you're everywhere and nowhere, you have to be moving at an infinite speed. So from a physics perspective, I'm curious to hear your perspective on that. I think from a physics perspective, it's far too narrow. Uh, you have to consider that pendulum as on a rotating Earth. It's, uh, the Earth is uh, moving around the sun. The sun is moving through the galaxy. It's certainly moving. Uh, it's never not moving. Uh, in fact, uh, all particles in the universe are in movement. And this is critical. Uh, it's the only way to form stable electrical systems is to have particles moving. And this is one of the aspects, too, of the arrow of time. Uh, all this idea that you can slow down time, speed it up, and so on, you cannot do that because it requires that you slow down and speed up the entire universe. And when you talk about time travel, you have to reverse uh, the movement of all the particles in the universe. Uh, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a trick. That's yeah. a trick that uh, takes quite a magician for sure. <laughs> That's right. It's a mind game, really. And uh, since there are all these misconceptions about time, time is universal. This is what uh, the instant connection of all particles in the universe by the electric force implies, that uh, there is a universal clock. But physical clocks will change their ticking rate depending on their energy. Once you understand that energy is associated with the movement of charged particles in relation to all other charged particles in the universe, it means that if you put a clock into orbit, say on a GPS satellite, all you do is you count a different number of ticks because the gravitational potential energy of that clock has changed. Uh, Einstein's proper clocks, as he called them, don't exist because uh, different, mo differently moving observers with relation to all the other matter in the rest of the universe, their clocks cannot tick at the same rate by definition. So uh, all of the nonsense about um, uh, time dilation and length contraction, Lorentz length contraction, is seen to be a, a mirage. You know, it's, a, it's where we stop doing physics. I have a, a question for you, and hopefully I don't irritate you with this one because it's not my intention. No, but, you I know, understand. you spoke of, you see, I, I'm really, this is how I learn, right? I, I study a lot, and it's hard to find people with enough depth because so many people are caught in the same paradigm. For example, if you look at the effects of quantum physics on psychology now, and even Jung uh, spent a lot of time with Wolfgang Pauli, and he was a he spent time with Einstein. So even somebody who 
moved psychology forward as much as Jung was still working in these paradigms that you're politely <laughs> destroying. Sure, sure. I think part of the problem is the language. The language of modern physics is generally uh, largely meaningless. And a lot of people understand that there is something behind there to un be understood, but they try and use this language, which, as I say, is meaningless. And so the result is a kind of confusion. The language is confused. And, uh, and, and this is the single greatest problem, is that uh, we've been taught a way of using language which is not useful for, for doing physics anymore. Uh, but it does, in the, you know, the good thing about it is that it opens up physics once again to the general public. Anyone can do science. You know, the Electric University could start to teach it in primary school and the kids would be proficient by high school. Um, it's not difficult. You don't need to be a, a, a pure mathematician to do physics. In fact, the work of these great scientists of the mid-19th century uh, proves that because uh, the mathematics they use, you've, you've done by uh, high school. Yes. Here's my question. You've spoke of the aboriginals. I've studied a lot on the Aboriginal shaman. I'm actually a licensed medicine man and spirit guide and have conducted over 400 healing ceremonies, uh, many, many, if not most of which used plant medicines. Mm -hmm. And I am also a remote viewer, and I won a remote viewing contest in London that was conducted by the CIA's remote viewing instructor, and I've actually helped find people that were lost uh, on two separate occasions, one in a fire in, in Melbourne um, and another one they couldn't find. It was uh, one of my students' uncle's house burnt down and they couldn't find him anywhere. So they contacted me and asked me if I could find him and I located him for them. And another one was three of my students uh, were on a hiking expedition in Washington I believe it was Mount Rainier, and they got caught by a flash snowstorm and ultimately froze to death. And their families, after a week of them not being there, uh, called in the the National Guard and search parties, and they couldn't find them. So one of my more advanced students knew that I'm a remote viewer and asked me if I could find them, and I did. And I told them where they would find them, and they did find them there. So the point I'm working toward here is I've spent a lot of my time, not only through remote, remote viewing, but what is classically called astral travel, working in and even meeting intelligences or beings in what we would classically call other dimensions. Is this what I'm experiencing and what shaman have been talking about through antiquity and actually healing thousands of people with millions, potentially, because shamanism's the roots of what we call religion, how does the electric universe account for these other dimensions and things like remote viewing? We just don't use the word dimensions. There is the here and now throughout the universe. Remember I said that uh, time is universal? Right. Uh, what you're experiencing uh, is uh, the very fact that the electric force operates instantly over any distance and therefore Remote viewing is possible. It's been proven. It cannot be shielded, just like gravity. Gravity is uh, the same kind of uh, force. It's the direct electric force. And uh, uh, very interesting because uh, one of the questions you've got there is a general belief about gravity, but we'll get to that. Um, so I actually have spoken to and one of the people in the, the Sapphire Project, which we'll talk about, uh, was involved in the remote viewing experiments. And when we did our first setup uh, of proof of concept experiment, we were working right next door to the Faraday cage where they did the Faraday cage remote viewing experiments in um, Toronto, in Canada. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, it works uh, because the it's not an electrical uh it can't be shielded, just like gravity. Gravity w operates. You go into a Faraday cage and you're still stuck to the floor by gravity. Uh, and the signals, that the mental signals and so on, and consciousness functions at the same speed. In other words, it's uh, infinite speed. 
that means that you, you know, and the fact that all particles in the universe are connected in real time by the electric force means that uh, such mental activities like remote viewing and uh, astral travel and so on indicate that this is the way that information is used through the universe to a generate life and sustain it. I love Symbiotica's products, as you all know. I share them as often as I can because they work and they're made of the best quality resources you can get. And Symbiotica has just come out with a new liposomal activated charcoal that has many amazing benefits. Sherveen, let us know what is the power, the potency, and the use of liposomal activated charcoal. Paul, this was an exciting one for us because, as you know, we're from the islands of Hawaii. And charcoal is really big over there in terms of detoxification. We make ours using coconuts. And this product's the first time it's ever been in a liposomal form, meaning it's protected to make it all the way down into the gastrointestinal area. And then it really starts taking on its action. Anyone that's got anything dealing with candida overgrowth, exposures to mold, radiation, pesticides, pharmaceutical residues, an overly acidic body... This is a very quick, easy way to provide a rapid solution to any of those issues. If you're dealing with bloating, anything like that, the way charcoal works, it's not an absorber that most people think. It's an adsorber. It's an electrical charge. So it pulls in anything that does not belong in the body into the charcoal and then evacuates and eliminates out. This is one of our top sellers. The reviews on it are incredible. I can't wait for anyone who hasn't used it to try it and just let us know their feedback. Exciting. So if you want to get your liposomal activated charcoal, go to C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com. That's symbiotica.com. And on checkout, use the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15 to get your 15% discount. And while you're there, check out all the amazing Symbiotica products because your discount applies across the board. Enjoy. So how... Could could I'm taking a stab at this? Is th- these what are classically called other dimensions then actually potentially us moving into domains that are real within the electric universe model, but are different frequency domains? Just like you can have signals on different frequencies that carry information, such as changing the frequency on your radio. You can go from rock and roll to the news to bad rap music, or you can, <laughs> you know, you can look at a cell phone and look at cell phone frequencies, and there's a bundle of frequencies, and you can actually tie frequencies to frequencies. Yes. So would would the electric universe model suggest then that when I or people like me are doing that kind of work, that we're actually accessing different frequency domains? Uh, you'll notice you're talking about radio signals there, which are the standard through the ether speed of light signals. This is uh, more like the Tesla direct uh, signal, direct signaling, the longitudinal electric signal and which is a different form of signaling. And it, in fact, it's just as well it is because otherwise all of the radio noise and uh, background that we live in now would be even more devastating for us. Uh, biological systems function by this direct signaling. Uh, the mind-body connection is one where all atoms in the body are in touch with each other and can exchange information to maintain all of the things that go on, the trillions of things that are going on in your body in every second. second. Mm. Yes, so one of the the theories for this, which I really quite believe, is photon emission and communication through the body at the speed of light. So just so I'm clear, are you saying Uh, that uh, what I'm uh, perceiving... Go ahead. before, Before you go on, there are no photons. Forget photons. (laughs) <laughs> then how do you account for Fritz Albert Pop's photon emission counters and 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 scientific it's an interpretation it's an of interpretation of uh, what we observe and the photon was invented to uh, answer the question of how do you transfer energy from A to B uh, well that's true it does take an electromagnetic wave but there is also this direct connection as well 
which can be the synchronizing signal, if you like, which makes uh, the receiving atom uh, in tune with the sending atom so that the two exchange the energy in that wave. So you're speaking really of a harmonic resonance then? It's resonance, all about resonance. So what if there's no photons, and what am I seeing when I look out the window right now as the sun's going down? You're just uh, getting the energy from the electromagnetic waves that reach your eyes. But they're not photons. Okay, so they're not but it, quanti- it is a- quantized packets. You're saying that's uh, no, really... The receiver and the transmitter both operate by sending uh, short bursts of radiation at a given frequency. And if the frequencies match, then your tuner, your receiver is tuned into the sender and you you get that energy. Okay, so then what I'm seeing is really back to the television analogy. I'm tuned into a frequency that we all share here on as our experience on Earth. Yes. And then that would also explain the different dimensions I was talking about as tuning into different frequencies that are somehow coupled with the experience that we're capable of accessing through the human central nervous system. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes, well, thank you. Obviously, uh, you were trained to be sensitized to uh, receiving this information or these signals, tuning into them. And that that's the trick. I think people can be trained to do it, and some people are very excellent at it, and others are not so good. <laughs> yeah, I... I uh won't sidetrack our conversation, but all this started coming about due to a very traumatic childhood and me as a 12 year old wishing the hell I could get out of this world. And I began having out of body experiences and I learned how to control them. Uh, and then I found that I could leave the house and then I begin checking and saying, am I having hallucinations? I was afraid to tell my parents for fear they might take me to a, a doctor and get me classified as a nutcase. But what I would do is I'd travel around the farm because we have a 142 acre farm. And I would say, okay, I'm going to go look for something that I can identify like a chainsaw or a tool. And then I would get up in the morning and go see if it was there. And every time it was there. So I proved to myself something's happening that I can't explain, but was able able to use that later as I develop my skills as a therapist to look into what was going on with people and could put my finger on the bullseye quite accurately enough to scare people. Yes. And so, um, you see, if someone like you, even with your knowledge, told me that I I was wrong about these things, I would just say, then you just have a completely different view of of reality (laughs) than I do. Yeah, but that's no, why I, I wanted to bring this up because one, I, I really respect you. That's why I wanted to interview you. Two, I wanted to see how how do these shamanic concepts and experiences that millions of people have had all over the world from throughout antiquity and still do fit the electric universe model. Yes, I think the uh, the take home message here is that the electric universe provides a model which can be used for investigators in future to either uh, better understand or actually analyze and figure out how to do such things better. But certainly, one side issue I should mention, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence or the SETI project, I have predicted for many years would fail because any advanced civilization would understand all of this and they would not be using radio waves, slow radio waves to communicate between uh, intelligences on other planets. No, that would be like going back to the Stone Age for them. Exactly. It'd be like smoke signals instead of uh, radio. Yeah, hard to get a smoke signal to another star system. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Oh, dear. So uh, since you've touched on that, what is your viewpoint on extraterrestrial beings or intelligences, since there's quite a lot of evidence that they've been here? Oh, I mean, the universe is a living organism, if you like. And so wherever life can gain a foothold on a, on a planet, 
uh, it will. This is why we find uh, you know sulfur devouring organisms at the bottom of deep oceanic trenches. We find um, uh, bacteria living in rocks kilometers down. Uh, in extreme temperatures. In extreme conditions, yes. Uh, life, if it finds a way of surviving elsewhere in the universe, that information is available throughout the universe. So uh, wherever life is, uh, you know, life forms like us have existed in the past, that information was there when conditions on Earth arrived which were conducive to our existence. This is why, I mean, the fossil record shows this. We have whole huge numbers of animals wiped out by uh, cataclysms in the past, which were global, and then a whole new range of uh, animals appeared thereafter. Some, some of the old ones survived, but and others changed. And the other aspect of that is, too, that it seems that um, the epigenetic changes can occur within a, a generation. They have to be able to change quickly to adapt to new circumstances. Yes, so that brings up a question. You know, not knowing the age of the universe and not being stupid enough to think we're the only intelligent beings that can process information and use creativity and that we may actually be a very, shall we say, young civilization compared to many that have been out there. And using the concepts of remote viewing and and the ability to communicate instantly, wouldn't it suggest that we could potentially be accessing intelligences from other beings through things like intuition? Yes. Intu intuition, uh, I should say intuition has been uh, one of my main guides uh, through all of this work because I was charting, you know, unknown waters when I started uh, discarding Einstein and all of these other key figures. Uh, and uh, I always used the, the key criterion of what I would finally come to consider as being uh, a more correct answer is uh, common sense. In other words, as an engineer, could I make this work? Can I see how it might work? And uh, this actually stood us in good stead when we did the Sapphire experiment, which I'll talk about later. Now... I have a, another question before we move forward because it's just trying to get out of me and we're hot on it here. And I think anyone listening to this is going to be just jacked up because this is very juicy, juicy conversation. I hope it's not boring you, but I'm finally getting some good answers because I really want to understand these concepts through the electrical universe. And I haven't found anything in the electrical universe's videos or anything that's talking about some of the things that we're talking about right now. So I'm, I, I got you corralled. Yeah, and I, guess. <laughs> I want to know what is the electric universe's definition of mind? Well, <laughs> this is the, the old question about uh, where does consciousness exist and where does memory exist? And Rupert Sheldrake is... Um, uh, I'm familiar with his work very much, so... Yes, yes. He's, he's one of the great scientists of the present day, simply because he's prepared to ask the hard questions and then just devise simple experiments to test them. Uh, our consciousness seems to uh, be held, our memory is held uh, beyond the body, uh, the, the brain seems to tune into it. And that brings into uh, the idea that uh, the work of Bruce Lipton, you, you will have heard of him. Yeah, I've studied him and I've tra traded books with him. Yes, yes. I met him uh, quite a few years ago and did the same. <laughs> uh, <laughs> He's a cool guy. <laughs> yes, he is. The uh, idea that um, the cells in the body have receptors on them which uh, actually decide what goes on inside the cell uh, suggests that, to him anyway, that some of those receptors, they didn't know what they were there for. They didn't seem to be tuning into the usual hormones and whatnot that uh, uh, circulate in the blood. And he felt that they were tuning into signals from beyond the body, and I think this is crucial, that the biological system, in particular the mind, is designed like a uh, both a receiver and transmitter, 
of these longitudinal signals. And the actual information is held in the uh, structure of the ether because the ether uh, being a comp- a made of real matter, particles and so on, which have uh, definite structures of their own, uh, is capable of holding uh, information, a huge amount of information. And so uh, also work done by people like uh, Eileen McCusick in... Um, Yes, I, I've I've read her books and watched her presentations on the Electric Universe. I love her work. I've actually used it. She visited us here uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, we had a very good um, uh, stay together uh, with the family. And um, uh, her work shows that there is this kind of enveloping. Field. Yeah, I don't like the word field because it's a description and not an explanation. The ether, the ether surrounding us. Uh, holds information from the body, and uh, and it's a two-way thing. And Eileen was able to show that uh, the extremities are things that I, memories from the past, you know, our past. And as you come closer to the body, they're more and more up to date. And you can find things that are affecting you physically uh, because of this mind-body interaction. Mm-hmm. The change she can you can pick. I I do this work so you can pick up the changes in the in the frequency of the tuning fork. You can actually feel yes. like you're running into something. <laughs> That's right. Uh, all of this has the opportunity to be investigated once you have picked up the physics of the electric universe because it provides a real physical testable model. And Eileen, I, I give her great credit, has done this as a skeptic. I mean, she was skeptical of her own results. But she has uh, tackled it in a scientific manner and has been investigating the results that she gets uh, and the techniques that are being used and developed uh, scientifically. And I think that's great. There's three things I'd like to put on the table, if I may. Mm -hmm. Um, Are you familiar with Greg Braden? Oh, crikey. (laughs) Yes, the name, name rings a big bell but i can't remember uh, uh he, he worked for nasa he's actually a geologist greg braden in his show um missing links which is fantastic it's on gaia and greg braden's quite a scientist as well and uses a lot of research from nasa and all sorts of stuff uh to show what he's trying to share but he actually investigated uh because the world's most powerful computers are using water for their hard drives But what happened was scientists were baffled as to how water could store the extremely large amounts of information that they were able to store into it. So they investigated this, and he actually showed the research uh, on his show, which is, is going right to where you were going. And what they showed is that the water actually isn't storing the information that the, wa- the, the water, the activity or the rotation of the water molecules is accessing a field. I know you don't like that field, but in, in you know a de- dictionary definition of a field is a place of action. So obviously there's a place of action wherever, whether we know where it's at and can locate it physically, just like Eileen Day McCusick's speaking of essentially a person's energy field or their aura or whatever, however you want to classify it. But that information is outside of their physical body. So I'm using the field in that <clears throat> perspective. But what the research showed is that the water's actually in in instantaneous communication with what they called a field and that is actually the field storing the information, not the water. So uh, I just didn't know if you had any comments on that. Well, we've uh, been very happy to have uh, Professor Jerry Pollack uh, from uh, Washington State. I'm familiar with his work, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, And he and I were having a discussion one evening after at one of our conferences, and he said to me uh, that uh, that water is uh, is life. You know, in other words, living systems uh, rely on water because it transfers information within the shell, within the cell, I should say. And uh, for instance, 
the DNA the question arises, how does the DNA uh, both move the materials that it needs to form proteins and so on uh, to, into the right positions along the DNA molecule? And uh, how does the other uh, minerals and whatnot that are re required to be moved throughout the cell actually told where to go? Well, it seems that water does both. It carries the information of the structure of the DNA throughout the cell, and it also functions as the carrier of the movement of materials throughout the cell. And the same goes with the blood supply. You know, the, if it wasn't for the uh, operation of water driven by infrared radiation, by the way, that's the energy source, uh, and its amazing ability to carry uh, material and information in both directions that, uh, you know, our blood supply just wouldn't work. You know, it's the old mechanical idea that is pumping blood as a liquid through all of the capillaries of the body or that trees can uh, transport material up, you know, 40, 50 the, feet against gravity, yeah, yeah. against gravity is nonsense. Uh, the water itself acts like a, uh, it is the motor and the driver is the energy that it gets from uh, infrared radiation and it forms structures. It has a, a memory so that um, homeopathy does have a physical mechanism and all of this can be understood and investigated using the electric universe paradigm. But of course, the medical profession don't want to know anything about it. In fact, uh, the Homeopathy was the major form of um, medical practice in England uh, before the pharmaceutical industry and the um, snake oil salesmen took over and, uh, and got rid of it. They actually actively got rid of it. Yeah, and <laughs> the people promoting it. And I forgot the name of the French scientist that uh, was one of the pioneers of homeopathy and did a lot of original research on that. Do you remember who he is? Yeah, Beyond Beneast, I think. Was. Yes, I watched a documentary on how the medical mon uh, you know, mafia ruined his career and took his credibility away, and he got so pissed off that he, invent he, he had robots made to do the experiments, and they did them over a thousand times and got the results every time that he was showing, but whenever the so-called medical people did it, they couldn't get the results because they didn't want to get the results. That's right. This is the other aspect of the electric universe and uh, the experiments that uh, physicists perform, and that is that the observer is a part of the experiment, whether they like it or not, and they can affect the outcome by their actions and their thoughts. Yes, and I, I think we all know that because our thoughts affect our physiology instantaneously, and so uh, without a long Segway, are you familiar with the physicist Jean Charon from France? He's not alive anymore, but he was he worked with Einstein and he worked on an expansion of the general field of theory of relativity, but he has a couple of books that look into what he calls spirit and matter. And he did a lot of work to explain what how he he really felt electrons are carriers of information kind of like water molecules are and that they had an inner dimension and an outer dimension and in the inner dimension he described how what we call time moved backwards and that there was always a state of neg entropy within the inner space of the electron but anyhow he was say, he's basically saying that electrons are the medium that carry uh, information throughout the universe. I'm curious if you have any thoughts or that or on that, or you heard of his work at all. Uh, the model of the electron was, um, which the electric universe uh, embraces, is that that I mentioned from the middle of the 19th century, uh, and that accounts for all of the phenomena that we witness. Uh, so. That that kind of theory that you've just mentioned is unnecessary. And it's not the electron that carries the information, it's the ether. It's the ether. The ether, the speed of light is actually, I would suggest, a measure of the 
what you call the moment of inertia of a spinning particle. And that spinning particle is the ether particle or neutrino. So, and of course, initially, when I was at university, we were taught that uh, neutrinos had no mass. They were, the words used, disembodied spin. Now, this is the kind of rubbish use of language that <laughs> physics has got used to. You cannot have disembodied spin. You know, how can you have nothing spinning? Yeah, that. Yeah, I understand this, and I have to wade through all these textbooks, and I'm trying to piece the puzzle together, but it's almost like a. Um, it, you're really getting into more of what we would call a myth than scientific fact. Yes, it is. It's a uh, yeah, religious myth. Anyway, um, the Electric Universe, by proposing that the ether particle, the neutrino, is a particle just like the electron and the proton, only it's uh, more collapsed. It's probably more like the nucleus of an atom compared to the uh, atom itself. And uh, When you say more collapsed, do you mean more dense? Well, yes, it is more dense, but um, the density is a, another aspect of um, uh, the structure of the object and also its energy because mass and energy are related. It's, it, <laughs> you've got to be very careful with the language you use once you get to the electric universe and you've defined things physically. When, when you speak, then you've got to think carefully, is this the right word? And sometimes I'd have to look at that and think, now it must be a better way of expressing that. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. I, I'm glad I'm making you think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, even, uh, even if it's about your words. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, one of the things you learn early on as a, a, um, a dissident is that you must choose your words carefully because the pseudo-skeptics, as I call them, the lazy uh, conformists, um, will jump on you even if you misspell somebody's name slightly, put one letter wrong uh, and uh, call you out as an idiot. So language is important. Uh, but it is very important in science because unless you know what somebody is talking about and the words are defined, well defined, then you actually, uh, it's like Chinese whispers. You know? Yeah, yeah. I, I study this this a lot. For example, a lot of people don't realize that in the Bible, whenever they use the word soul, during that period of time, the word soul meant the equivalent of what we use as the word mind today. So when we start reading these older documents, be they mythological or otherwise, we're actually using our modern understanding of words and assuming they meant the same thing. But there's a long, long list of uh, words when you start really researching the etymology of words uh, that mean that a lot of the things that we're saying are completely wrong compared to what those actual documents were saying. Oh, that's true. Yes. And in fact, you have to remember that um, a lot of the religious uh, books and that were written by a, a committee of men uh, thousands of years ago or many hundreds of years ago. And often the meanings of the words that they have chosen uh, have been lost in translation. Uh, and whatever source they ca were using also often has been lost. So we can't compare and uh, try and get a better grip on what was being originally described. Yes, there's a phenomenal book called Prayers of the Cosmos by a guy named Neil Donald Klotz. <laughs> that sounds interesting. Well, I'll tell you why it's interesting. He spent 14 years studying Aramaic, which theoretically would have been the actual language that Jesus spoke. And he took the Beatitudes and anything attributed to having been said by Jesus, and he went back to the oldest known Bible, which had Aramaic in it, and he translated those words directly in Aramaic. And then he showed, because Aramaic, I think, only has something like 14 or 16 symbols in their alphabet, which means any word can mean many more things. And in his book, he shows oftentimes there's four, as many as four or more different meanings for every given word attributed to Jesus. And he showed how the church carefully selected the interpretations that supported their dogma but when you actually read what he could have been saying, it opens up a whole new way of relating to whatever this 
mythological figure Jesus was saying. Yes, this is something that occurred uh, in my experience. I was at a, uh, a meeting in a home in Portland, Oregon, uh, with Dwight Cardona, and there were a group of um, Seventh Day Adventists in the room. And oh Dwight, they'd been asked. <laughs> They'd been asking questions about interpretations of the book of Genesis. And Duadu, uh, one person said, how much of, after a bit of discussion, one of the pers- people asked, uh, how much of the book of Genesis has been mistranslated? And Duadu looked at them and said, all of it. Yes, yes, and I would the, have the, to the say re- so. Yeah, the reason he said that was that the experiences of the people who wrote down these memories of these catastrophic events uh, was so far beyond anything we experience today, either on the sky, in the sky or on the land, that uh, the words used later were misinterpreted. Even the word earth originally referred to what was being constructed in the sky. So the waters beneath the earth were the uh, shimmering plasma between whatever that object was and us. Uh, all of these things only become clear once you've understood that the light, the sky that was witnessed and was being des- uh, described in those early books had no resemblance to the one we have today. That's another reason I should say why the Australian Aboriginal work, which has been passed down for thousands of years, in both uh, song and dance and uh, ritualistic, uh, uh, you know, behaviour is more accurate because it's difficult to mistranslate uh, song and dance. <laughs> well, yes, and and the other thing is because it's song and dance, it's um, like poetry. It's open to individual interpretation unless you are part of the tribe that knows exactly what those songs and dance mean. That's it. And uh, there is a book here called Yoro Yoro, uh, All Things Standing Up, I think is the subtitle. But it was uh, written by a woman in Sydney, Yuta Malnik, and she uh, lived with the Aborigines in northwestern Australia, which is one of the areas that um, has some amazing rock art. And... uh, Questioning the meaning of the rock art, the Aboriginal elder was quite specific in the words that he was uh, to use, the English words to express what these rock symbols meant. And they are quite remarkable. Uh, When I read the work, I understood instantly what this Aboriginal elder was talking about in terms of... uh, the research of uh, Dave Talbot and Dwayne Cardona, but it would be meaningless to a modern-day astronomer simply because they have never thought about the idea that perhaps the sky in those far-off times was absolutely different to what we witness today. Yes, and one of the things that came up uh, while I was just thinking as you were talking is that one of the things about remote viewing is you're not bound by time. In other words, whatever we call time is you're not bound by it. All I've got to do is if I want to ask, if I, if I want to know what happened on earth 10,000 years ago, all I have to do is hold my attention on it and just stay with that question and the tricky part is is that you will move around at the speed of thought. So that's one of the reasons <laughs> a lot of people can't remote view is because they can't hold their focus. But you can actually find a lot of these things out. And this is why I think that there is some validity in the studies of ancient wisdom cultures and traditions that, like the aboriginals that had these abilities. It's just there's nobody around to really translate it for us. And my challenge is I got a business to run, a life to live, kids to feed, so I can't spend my whole life remote viewing. (laughs) (laughs) Earth to Major Tom. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. If someone will just pay my bills, I'll just remote view all day and answer questions for people. But, um, I'm, you know, we've got a a long list of things to go through and I don't want to burn you out, but, uh, 
what's what's the next thing you'd like to cover of the beliefs about gravity? Yes, that's a big one. Uh, Let's hear it. I'm since, into it. You got me all excited. <laughs> righto. Well, since gravity is the basis of our modern cosmology and has given rise to dark matter and dark energy and black holes, let's shed a bit of light on it instead. The interesting, the most interesting work was done by Dr. Halton Arp, who was a leading young astronomer, actually worked with uh, Hubble for some while, and he spent years analysing uh, what he called um, uh, you know, peculiar galaxies. He, he produced the Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies, and he had pinned up around his office wall all of these galactic forms so that uh, he was immersed in them every day. Anyway, at some point he came upon the relationship between a galaxy and a stream of matter which was sort of strung out away from the galaxy and it had these uh, quasars embedded in this stream. And the quasars, of course, are these high redshifted objects they had quite different redshifts to the central galaxy. So he wrote a paper, which, uh, and he was a leading young astronomer at the time. He wrote this paper uh, signaling that this meant that the redshift was not a measure of distance because all of these low and high redshift objects were all connected. And uh, Subramanian Chandrasekhar, who was the uh, person who was uh, the editor of the Astrophysics Journal, I think it was at the time, rejected it simply by scrawling across the top, this exceeds my imagination. Well, that's his problem. That's his problem, absolutely. And, I mean, uh, Halton Arp uh, had all of the uh, observational material to back him up. Anyway, so that... Uh, and Halton Arp being a, one of the few real scientists in the present day, pursued this uh, research and he eventually had uh, Sir Fred Hoyle and Geoffrey and Margaret Burbage, all leading astronomers, supporting him, saying that uh, it's a, the chances he's wrong are millions to one because he then identified uh, these quasars strung out along the axis of active galaxies. And uh, he then decided, or when he, from his observations, he observed that they often ejected these things at intervals in both directions along the axis, the spin axis. And the ones that were further away had slightly different redshifts. And it seemed that the redshift decreased, but it decreased in quantum jumps, would you believe? Which means that quantum theory, according to modern physics, is only applies to the atomic scale. That's rubbish. It applies also at the galactic and extra galactic scale. So whatever your theory of gravity and physics uh, is, it has to deal with quantization at these sorts of levels. It's another reason for saying that the universe is an interconnected whole. It's an organism. Everything is connected. Anyway. Yes, I, I agree. I mean, that's my experience. Yeah. The other thing is that we've put up the Hubble telescope in recognition of Hubble's uh, discovery of the expanding universe. He did no such thing. He devised a redshift distance relationship, and he said the most unlikely possibility is that we're seeing an expanding universe. It is far more likely that there's some physics we don't understand. And he was right, and that is the physics of gravity. The physics that was missing is our understanding of gravity. In effect, Einstein did away with the force of gravity. So he did no better than uh, Sir Isaac Newton because Sir Isaac Newton had the honesty to say, uh, although his equation worked on the planetary system, he had no explanation for it. He advanced no hypothesis. Uh, Einstein's work has tended to obscure the fact that uh, Einstein did away with the force of gravity, which you just cannot do, because obviously there is a force in action. So that uh, was the trigger for me to understand 
the universe in terms of a real force of gravity. And Alton Arp's work, in effect, showed that instead of being an expanding universe, uh, 13 billion years old or whatever it is, uh, and also now accelerating expanding universe uh, due to this so-called dark energy, the very fact that uh, these quasars, which are supposed to be at the very limits of our uh, ability to detect them with uh, uh, telescopes, uh, are actually closer, fainter, that is redder as well, uh, just indicates that the universe is smaller than we think and also, strangely, it's in balance. So the gravitational force cannot be a purely attractive force. There's something going on here which is just not covered by any uh, present-day thinking. But Newton himself and uh, also a, a fellow called Lesage developed the theory of gravity which was repulsive because that was a possibility as well and that the shadowing effect of between repulsive bodies could also give you the same results as Newton's attractive gravity. But nobody could figure out how you could do this. There were suggestions of uh, particles whizzing through the universe at very uh, you know, superluminal speeds. But all of this involved the exchange of energy, which in the case of the Earth would uh, be enough to uh, have it sh uh, shining incandescently. The electric universe says, no, the uh, gravitational force is actually a dipole force. And planets and stars are formed electromagnetically. And once they're formed, the atoms all have their nuclei uh, pulled towards the center of the object by this gravitational force, and they uh, form tiny electric dipoles in the atoms, which means that, in effect, each celestial body is like a one pole of a magnet, and they're all the same pole because all the heavy nuclei, positive nuclei, sink in towards the centers of the bodies, and the electrons uh, orbits are distorted so that they point outwards. So gravity is a dipole force. It's like a magnet. And therefore, when you form these bodies electromagnetically, drawing all the material together, the end result is that the object is more likely to be hollow to begin with because the internal repulsive force between all of those little magnets all uh, facing the same pole towards each other will tend to repel and outside the negative pole gravitational pole is pointing towards the sun which is also pointing its negative pole towards us and just like two magnets when you try and push the same poles together they push each other apart it gives you a balanced universe now Halton Arp himself realized that Lesage gravity as he called it uh, he wrote a paper on the subject saying that this provides a, an answer but without uh, providing a physical underlying model. So I saw that as my job. And it turned out that there was a fellow, uh, a sort of amateur scientist in New York who'd come up with a theory for gravity which involved giving the electron and the proton structure like an atom so that you've got an, an atomic structure within an atomic structure. And this is a common feature in the universe of repeated patterns at different scales. Kind of like a water molecule, isn't it? Well, uh, a water molecule is a dipole uh, molecule as well, which is why you can uh, hold billions of tons of water in uh, uh, storm clouds high above the Earth and then electrically release that uh, in floods and you know downpours and all this kind of thing. I was thinking more along the lines of the clathrate, though, the, the rotational component of the water, because from what I've studied of the water molecule is it's, uh, as an analogy, it's like a spinning gyroscope with gyroscopes inside of it that somehow are encoding information. Is, is that concept wrong? Uh, it's 
It's more complicated than that. Okay. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Okay. <laughs> with the result that water forms very complex structures uh, within uh, bulk water. Uh, it's not just a simple H2O molecules bouncing around. It's not like that at all. Uh, this is why snowflakes have uh, seemingly, seemingly an infinite number of different shapes. It's because of the structures that uh, water tends to form. Uh, the important thing with uh, Halton Arp's work was he discovered this quantization, which indicates that the redshift itself is due to the energy of the matter in that quasar, and it changes over time. And as it changes, the redshift decreases, the mass increases, and the quasar goes into, uh, generally into an orbit about its parent galaxy. And so we have an almost biological picture of how galaxies are formed. And I think that uh, is, it just, <laughs> it, it sort of ties a ribbon around this model that uh, says it answers all of these uh, questions, uh, even the quantization because this is uh, the electrons and the protons within these quasars gradually shift from one orbital level of energy to a different orbital of level of energy within the particles themselves. Uh, this throws modern physics, uh, I mean, it shows that there are so many so-called uh, fixed ideas and theories and standards and so on that have uh, uh, held today, which ju just cannot be correct, and it, it requires a complete overhaul. Yes. Now, you mentioned something earlier that I didn't want to interrupt you with. You said uh, you were speaking, and you said it alluded to the fact that certain bodies, and I think you might have been referring to planets, were hollow inside. Did I pick that up correctly? Yes. Um, and in fact, there is evidence for this, both seismically for the Earth and for the Moon. When uh, the seismometers were placed on the Moon and they crashed one of the orbiting uh, spacecraft uh, into the Moon, to more or less uh, as a seismic experiment, the Moon rang like a bell for an hour. And that was the kind of... Uh, headlines in the uh, popular science news at the time. And of course, the obvious answer is that the moon is hollow. But of course, this flies in the face of gravitational theory. So it, they had to uh, come up with some stories to try and <laughs> cover this possibility. Uh, as far as the Earth is concerned, uh, there is this core mantle boundary, as it's called. Now, the structure of the Earth is a very complicated one. And it was devised to try and explain why uh, there are certain areas around the Earth where from a deep earthquake, the signal is uh, either very weak or it's non-existent. And it's a, it's a bit of a puzzle. So we have this very complicated structure of the inside of the Earth. But to the surprise of uh, geologists who were studying this, um, they said that deep earthquakes have shown that the core mantle boundary is rougher than the surface of the Earth. And this is what I would expect if the center of the Earth were hollow. Uh, the other aspect of all of this is, too, if we don't understand gravity, then measuring the mass of a body by a Newton's law, for instance, doesn't give us enough information. We can't tell what that body is constructed from and how much of heavy elements compared to light elements a body is constructed from. Uh, because the actual mass of the body is an energetic variable. E equals mc squared tells us that. But nobody considers that the energy of a body can change electrically. And this is uh, a huge failing, it seems, both at the galactic scale with our quasars gradually gaining in mass over time this is one of the uh, puzzles that uh, Halton Arp addressed. And I used his findings as a gauge for whether the Electric Universe cosmology made sense. And it ticked all the boxes, I'm pleased to say. Are you familiar with Rudolf Steiner? Yes. Uh, well, not, not familiar, but I certainly uh, support his views on uh, schooling, for instance. For, okay, good. I've got 
about 170 of Rudolf Steiner's books, most of which are uh, translated from transcriptions of his lectures that he gave to his students all over the world. In one of them, he talks about the sun. And he, he says, and this is probably around 1900 to 1905, I would imagine, or in that early 1900s, Steiner said, our conceptions of the sun are very incorrect. He said, in truth, if you were to go into the sun, it would be a hollow sphere, like a giant <laughs> spherical mirror. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. I, I just wanted to share that with you because when you said hollow bodies, I immediately remembered reading Steiner's description of the sun as a hollow body, like a giant spherical mirror. Mm. The other thing about the sun is, too, and all stars, is that when they're formed, planets and stars are formed at the same time in these electromagnetic uh, thunderbolts in molecular clouds. I haven't got time to go into that now, but it's all covered in the uh, thunderbolts.info, space news, and uh, our uh, conf conference videos. Is that related to what you called the pinch currents? or? Yes, that's right. And in fact, it's like uh, lightning. We, we experience lightning in the Earth's atmosphere. In the diffuse clouds of dust and gas in the universe, uh, the lightning is more diffuse, but it still forms uh, long lightning channels of equal length over vast distances. And that's characteristic, of course, of the lightning bolt. It's the same thin streak of light down to the ground over kilometers uh, in molecular clouds, it can stretch over many light years. But along that channel, uh, it, it's like a great vacuum cleaner. It sucks electromagnetically charged particles and the dust and gas in along the uh, channel and heats it so that uh, the infrared telescopes uh, are able to pick it up. And when they peer through the clouds of dust and that using infrared telescopes, they can actually see these long, thin channels along which the stars are spread, are spread like um, uh, the expression was like uh, uh, pearls on a string. Now, at the same time, planets and other smaller bodies are being formed. When, that, uh, when they get to a certain mass, the lightning cannot constrain them. Uh, it sort of moves moves away and leaves these bodies in a long line. And from that, uh, they form the planetary systems. And all of these exoplanetary systems that have been observed have thrown into doubt the theory of the formation of our own solar system simply because they look nothing like our solar system. Our solar system, because all the bodies are a long way from the sun, is a blended family of captured bodies and uh, the capture episodes have been distributed throughout the history of the sun so that uh, there are some newcomers. And according to the research of David Talbot and Dwight Cardona, and also uh, hinted at by uh, Emmanuel Velikovsky back in the 1950s, the history of the solar system was witnessed by modern man, the, the most recent part where we and Mars and Saturn and uh, a few other uh, bodies were entered the sun's environment and uh, everything changed. This is uh, best uh, described by David Talbot's work, uh, the remembering the end of the world and the subsequent videos describing and laying out the evidence for uh, the re- construction of the history of the solar system. Very interesting. Okay, now, because I know we have limited time, I want to go backwards to something you said. You said there are no photons. On Greg Braden's show, he showed a scientific experiment in which they created a vacuum and they used a, a, a photon um, measuring device that can capture single photons. And they actually showed the video recorded from inside the instrument. And inside the vacuum, what, what, what they call photons were emitting spontaneously, just like sparks appearing and disappearing. 
And then they took human DNA, put it inside the vacuum chamber, sucked all the air out and made a vacuum, and they used the same photon camera to see what was happening, and all the photons begin to circulate around the DNA and form the exact pattern of the DNA surrounding the DNA, which looked exactly like a copy of the DNA. So imagine the strand of DNA as the shaft or the axle, and around it, the photons started rotating in the exact pattern of the DNA, which you could see as clear as a bell using this instrument that can see single photons. So based on the electric universe model, what exactly were we seeing in both cases as what was first just an empty vacuum with emissions of photons and second, as these photons following the exact ge uh, geometric pattern of the DNA, how would that be explained in the electric universe model? Oh, I'd have to actually uh, read or look at the experiment to uh, form... I'll see if I can track it down for you because I want definitely to get your opinion because it was mind-boggling. Ultimately, what they were showing is that DNA is actually has an organizing principle and that it is actually affecting the space around it. It's not just some physical mechanism. It's, you know, spiritually speaking, my investigations into the DNA showed me that the DNA is a cosmic antenna and that what is called junk DNA is actually a record of the evolution of our species all the way back to bacteria, viruses, and fungi, and that our DNA actually hold, shall we say, the information that allows us to actually connect to all living forms and communicate with them and them to communicate with us. So we're in a real-time experience with the environment with all living things because we are an accumulation of all those things um, so that that's what my kind of using approaches like remote viewing that's what i came to but i i will dig through the episodes and i will email you the exact episode because the video footage is quite stunning when you see what happens when they put the dna in a vacuum changer and watch what these photons but my my question is if there's no photons in the electric universe model, are we just seeing waves of electromagnetic activity that we're calling photons? Yeah, it's a case of um, understanding what you're looking at and then using the right terms, that's all. So uh, what we see can be described by photons, but uh, it's a description only. It's not necessarily the full explanation. Okay. So just to finish up then, um, we're currently doing a lot of damage to the planet using fossil fuels and coal to power electric power generators. Um, what are some of the suggested alternatives for electric power based on the electric universe model? In other words, uh, what advances are you aware of regarding potential solutions to our current problems of having safe, clean energy? Because I think that if we don't solve that issue, we may uh, <laughs> extinguish ourselves. Yes, yeah, sure. One of the uh, real experiments that have been done uh, in just the, the last decade has to do with a model of the sun which regards it as uh, part of an electrical circuit. And if you remember the old gas discharge tubes and the experiments done in the 1900s with... Um, uh, evacuated tubes with an anode and a cathode and you connect them up to a high voltage source and you see these uh, displays of discharge inside that tube. Well, it's that kind of science that's involved in uh, the model of an electric sun. And back in the early 70s, uh, an American engineer, uh, Ralph Sandsbury, uh, Ralph Jurgens, I should say, Ralph Jurgens uh, from uh, Flagstaff, Arizona, proposed, as he, I should say also, he was a close colleague of Velikovsky and worked on the uh, scientific aspects of uh, the kinds of uh, proposals that were coming out of the work of Velikovsky and also David Talbot and others. 
And he came up with an electric model of the sun. He said, everything we observe on and above the sun uh, shouldn't be there according to the so-called standard model of the sun. They're not explained by that model. You have to turn a blind eye to that and just make up a, a theoretical model and without any reference to what we actually observe. And he was quite right. And I, I was uh, absorbed in his explanation because I could see from my electrical engineering experience that uh, what he was saying was uh, correct. Not only that, it did explain the appearance of the photosphere, the sunspots, the uh, uh, chromosphere, the red glow that's seen during total eclipses, and the corona, and the so-called high temperature of the corona which is inexplicable in the current terms because it's like having uh, the coldest region around the sun being just uh, at its surface, at the photosphere, uh, which is crazy. You know, millions of degrees inside and millions of degrees outside and you've got this photosphere at 6,500 degrees. So that model uh, was tested finally. I was actually... Uh, good friends with a professor of physics at uh, the University of Lethbridge in Alberta, Canada, who was a close colleague of Ralph Jurgens. And uh, this professor, Earl Milton, uh, visited me in Australia and also uh, I invited him to several of our conferences when I was working in the UK. And... Uh, he championed Ralph Jurgens, and uh, unfortunately, both of them have, uh, well, Ralph Jurgens in particular died within a fortnight, I think, of uh, Velikovsky. It was a double whammy back then in 1979. Uh, but um, Earl Milton carried on for many years, and uh, he too has passed on. It was one of the reasons why I felt that it was up to me then to carry the, the can carry the. Uh, this torch. idea, of, yeah, the torch forward for Ralph uh, Jurgens. As a result, uh, an a very experienced engineer from Canada wrote me after the GFC saying that he'd been investigating solar panels and came across my uh, renditions of uh, the electric sun model, and he was very interested in it because he said as an engineer he could see no disparities. And he said this was the first time he'd ever looked at a model and said, yes, I can see how that works and I can't see any problems. <laughs> and uh, anyway, we got independent uh, funding uh, to set up the SAFIRE project, it was called. SAFIRE was spelled S-A-F for Freddie, I-R-E, Stellar Atmospheric Function in Regulation Experiment. The meaning of those words were that uh, my engineer friend, Montgomery Child, said, when you look at the night sky, these stars shine steadily night after night and you know, for thousands of years that we know of and millions of years, uh, presumably, whatever the process is, it has to be very stable and well controlled, which is t totally unlike the hydrogen bomb type model of uh, standard solar physics. So uh, initially we did a proof of concept model and I specified the things I wanted to see to be sure that uh, the next step would be worth pursuing. And within uh, a day or two of starting up that experiment, uh, it fulfilled all of those requirements and so the funding for the next step was produced and uh, the SAFIRE project uh, moved to a much bigger uh, vacuum chamber and uh, a lot of money was spent, millions of dollars were spent on uh, the very best uh, uh, e uh, test equipment which was in, introduced into the chamber to test the plasmas and whether the model replicated what we observed around the sun. It did... It passed all those tests uh, within a few hours of turning it on. It was that good. The big part of the 
uh, experiment, though, was something that I insisted upon. It was hinted at by Ralph Jurgens back in the 70s, but nobody had any idea how it might be accomplished. And I, uh, a few years later in the 70s, came across the idea of low-energy nuclear transmutations of elements. And I realized that the lighter elements transmuting into heavier elements will release energy in general. They're exothermic, as it's called, and that that could provide most of the radiant output of the sun. So, in effect, the sun uses the plasma environment produced by the electric discharge from the galaxy and that sets up the environment to produce nuclear energy at uh, benign levels. So that was the big test. And late last year at the University of Bath in England, it was announced that it passed the test. The Sapphire experiment was producing 14 times more uh, energy out than was being put in. This far exceeds any other nuclear experiment, including fission and fusion experiments. And it shows that the pursuit of fusion like the sun is totally misguided because A, we don't understand the sun, and B, fusion energy by smashing particles together is not the way nature does things. Nature is far more intelligent. And it uses nuclear chemistry, which is what we're doing. And uh, so this power source for the future is already assured. Uh, the development is underway and uh, investors have already uh, been put, being put uh, money into the uh, project to do the further experiments to produce a marketable system of energy production. But what's even better is that because we're doing nuclear chemistry, just like physical chemistry, we believe that we can use the same uh, model to take radioactive waste, extract the energy quickly, and produce non-radioactive waste from it. And that, I mean, both the energy production and the nuclear remediation are trillion-dollar industries. So. Uh, we're hopeful that we can make one huge difference to the planet. I think that, so if I'm understanding you right, are we using the understanding of how the sun works to create the equivalent of a miniature sun that powers things? Yes. What we're doing is we're actually got a, a miniature star in our chamber and it's very stable. We can just turn the dials to get it to do what we want it to do. Uh, which is exactly what the engineer expected if we had done the experiment correctly and that the theory was correct. Excellent. Uh, if I can just ask one last question. Um, you know, question five is an electric circuit has to have a positive and negative polarity and something to insulate the circuits. And in the case of the universe, some source of potential energy to draw from can you please explain the basics of what creates the amplitudes or polarity differentials within space so that electricity can flow? And what is the potential that the current is drawn from? So what I want to do is set up a, a, a visual image so that people listening and maybe to help you understand better what I'm really asking, if it sounds convoluted. I understand what you're asking. Uh, as with the question of how did the universe uh, begin? We don't know the answer to that, but we can begin asking much better questions. When it comes to the question of where does the electrical energy come from, uh, we don't know the answer to that, but we can observe that we are in a circuit, and the way we do that is by using radio telescope uh, detection of the magnetic fields, which the electric currents flow in the direction of the magnetic fields. So along the spiral arms of galaxies, the, the magnetic field was discovered, much to the surprise of astronomers, to be well structured. In other words, the magnetic field follows the curve of the uh, spiral arms. Electric current flows along the spiral arms. The stars sit like street lights along the spiral arms. 
and uh, the current flows into the centre where it forms what's known as a plasmoid. There are no black holes, as I said. The plasmoid is the most uh, concentrated energy you can have in an electric discharge. It's like a tiny donut, and the donut stores the electrical energy until such time as the particles get so close together down the axis that they collide and form neutrons. Protons and electrons form neutrons. And they are ejected in beams out along the axis. Now, for many years, engineers have known, electrical engineers have known that you can produce a plasma gun very simply. Uh, and this is, in effect, what galaxies do. They produce a plasma gun, and that plasma gun uh, goes off episodically and ejects quasars along the spin axis as Halton Arp discovered. And those uh, quasars then uh, gain mass, they, uh, their light uh, moves more towards the normal spectrum over time, and the, uh, they uh, go into orbit about their parent. So we have this interesting, almost biological view of galaxies and stars and how they're formed along these electrical umbilical cords. And of course, in recent years, there are all sorts of discoveries. Each one has surprised uh, astronomers. One is that uh, galaxies seem to be aligned over huge distances in space. And uh, the same thing we find with stars along these filaments in molecular clouds. Ga gravity cannot do that. Gravity can't do these things. The electric currents flowing through space can. So the answer to the question is, uh, the suns are positively charged with respect to the rest of the galaxy. They're electron deficient. The electrons flow towards them and they pinch down to form uh, the characteristic shape of the uh, heliospheres, which has been discovered by the Voyager spacecraft and the IBEX mission has discovered the next rung out in the pinch in a circle like a circle of beads around the solar system. So the, the confirmation just comes in almost daily from space that uh, this is correct, this is the correct model. And meanwhile, astronomers are surprised at almost every discovery they make. It must be very rewarding for you. Oh, it is, it's wonderful. And the thing is that I've managed to get this far by sharing everything I thought I knew and as a leader, expecting other leaders to put up their hands and say, I'd like to work on this, uh, and I'm, I encourage anyone to get involved because we have garage experimenters now around the world uh, producing the sort of scarring you see on Mars, on the Earth, and so on, which shows that these planets have experienced intense electrical sculpting in their histories. And all of this means that geology has to change. It means that our theories of astronomy have to change. Our biology theories have to change. Everything changes. and But most important of all, our culture will change when we understand our past, the real past, and our connection to the Earth as Earthlings and uh, how we must work together with the Earth for our future. Amen. You know, the question that I <clears throat> just asked about the positive and negative and the polarity, I... I the, I just wanted to share the analogy I was going to give. If you take a cup, the empty space is the negative, and the part you hang on to is the positive, the, the shape of the cup. But those things have to come from somewhere. In other words, whatever the cup is had to have come from somewhere, even if you break it down to subatomic particles, which is what I was looking for when I said, where is the potential that we're drawing to create these polarities that manifest as objects from stars to galaxies to planets to moons to cups? So I, un I understand your answer, which is an honest one. We don't know. Um, the closest guess I had is, is it the zero point field? And, and, no, um, there's no such thing. Okay. So um, I guess then what you're saying is that Harriman's philosophy of the fluctuations at the Planck scale are, are yes. wrong? Yes. All of that quantum stuff is statistical. 
and therefore it's not necessarily physics. That's great. Well, I have to keep exploring, and boy, have you been a great tour guide <laughs> for the Electric Universe, and I think many minds should be if you're sitting in your chair at any point going, oh, that's bullshit, it means you do not know how to think constructively. And instead of saying it's bullshit, it should be, I better ask better questions, investigate, get clear, because you'll never know what's bullshit or what's not until you have enough knowledge to discern that from a place of wisdom as opposed to just using outdated models to try to uh, shun the most advanced science we have right now. How can people find out more about the Electric Universe? What websites? Uh, where would you like to refer people to? Well, my personal website is holoscience.com. That's H-O-L-O science.com. The idea being that science should be holistic, not specialist. Uh, the Thunderbolts website is our major uh interface with the public because there's a forum there where you can ask questions, get involved, you can subscribe and assist because it's a non-profit organization. Uh, and I'm currently working on the book, which will lay all of this out so that you can investigate and check for yourself uh, the references and so on. What's the website for the Thunderbolts? Is it the thunderboltsproject.com? No, it's thunderbolts.info. Thunderbolts.info, yes. Yep. Fantastic. You know, I must share something interesting with you. This conversation must be very interesting because three frogs have come and sat on my window <laughs> right in front of me. And I've never seen that happen before. There's three frogs right on my window hanging out right here. Like they're just like listening to this going, uh, yes, more, more. So <laughs> I wish I... I wish you could see this. It's pretty wild. It's interesting that animals sense things uh, that we are currently in our world uh, unable to sense. So yes, well, they they must sense that the truth is is uh, we're we're moving in the direction of of a greater awareness. I think, and that's what real learning's about. I think that's what we're all here to do. Ultimately, I don't know. I I I'm, I trust this is true for you, but I feel most alive when I'm growing and when I'm connecting dots and finding a deeper sense of meaning. And as you know, that always leads to bigger questions and it's like a horizon. You can never catch the horizon. You, that's right. Each answer just keeps the horizon moving. And I think that's God's great trick. God's great punchline is there is no ultimate answer. You just keep on looking. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> it's quite, well, quite thank an adventure. You. Yeah, it is. I'm very, very grateful for your time. And thank you for all your commitment to advancing science and, and bringing such great minds together and creating an open forum. Uh, I've absolutely just totally loved everything I've learned from the Thunderbolts Project and the Electric Universe. And I've watched a lot of your presentations and, and I've always thought, damn, I got to get that guy on my podcast. And I was, I actually about done a backflip when you responded back to me so quickly and you agreed to do it. I'm like, oh my God, there is the great spirit is supporting my podcast and my own evolution. So thank you, Walt. You're a blessing for us all. And I really appreciate everything you're doing. And thank you to all of you listeners. If you love this podcast as much as I do, share it and let everybody know to have a notebook handy <laughs> <laughs> and go explore the electric universe and the thunderbolts projects. It's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, there's great videos. And if you sign up for the thunderbolts, uh, newsletter, it comes out regularly with current investigations from, um, astronomy and, and, uh, space probes and, and, uh, often with Walt's explanations of what's really going on and his critiques of how badly they're trying to explain it from the old models. So it's always fun. I love watching you, uh, do Kung Fu on these guys. <laughs> yes. It's, uh, I think the payback for me is the number of people who write and say, you've changed my life. And I don't think, yeah, well, I'm one of them. I don't think I can do any better than that. No, and thank you. So lots of love. Enjoy the rest of your day and uh, keep doing what you're doing. It's really important. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for the opportunity. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. 
Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Walt Thornhill. You can find more about Walt's work online at thunderbolts.info and hollowscience.com or connect with him via Facebook at wall.thornhill. Follow Paul on Instagram and Twitter at Living 4D Podcast or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash Living 4D with Paul Check. Remember, you can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and the Czech Institute's new media site, chikiva.com.